podcast um today we have a very special episode with very special guests we have kim and sage of head over feels hello say hi, hi to the internet, internet. You need to introduce yourselves by explaining how special are you oh very special the, what's the scale yeah of specialness <laughs> well like how do we base this we'll say like like a one would be like not special and like a 10 would be like like michael jordan special so your standard Scale of one to ten. Yeah, That's but like Michael Jordan would be a 10. Michael Jordan He's the top is the of standard. It. Okay. Michael yeah. Jordan and Robert Downey Jr. is like a thirteen. Michael Jordan playing baseball or Michael Jordan playing basketball or Michael, Michael Jordan, Jordan in baseball. Space Jam or Michael. Jordan okay, Space Jam. then he's a ten, and we'll go with we'll go with Robert Downey Jr. as a thirteen. <laughs> and um, how about zero not being special and ten being pretty damn special? <laughs> Anybody? I mean, but obviously we think we're pretty damn special. I don't so. really think so. Okay. But I don't think we're Michael Jordan level special. I mean, I'd give us like an 8.5 on that scale. I, yes, I would right? agree. Yeah. A minus, B plus. Sure. We weren't even going to have a review today. Point. Well, no, there you yeah. go. We, oh, reviewed well. we reviewed ourselves. We reviewed ourselves. And we were ourselves. honest about it. And we think highly of ourselves. So now you know what to put so in that column highly. on the thing. That's right. Uh, all right, fine. Yeah. B plus, you're you're going to be added to the chart, the big, the big board. The big boards. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're it's an Excel document. Our guest brought us this week um, something different. Um, we're not actually doing a review this week. We are. We listened to a playlist constructed by uh, Sage and Kim from a larger, much larger playlist that they will get into. <laughs> this playlist is called the Ultimate Rose and Doctor Mixtape. Um, it's sixteen tracks. The original is how many? Seven hundred and twenty nine. Songs. It 49 is 49 hours. full hours. And of, this one was only an hour and yes. six minutes. So they called out 48 hours worth. So l- last week when you announced this, and you had originally said that it was 12 hours long because you, you, you got you an hour sorely long. mistaken. Yeah, but <laughs> I said, oh, well, that's okay. That's in a day's work. And you're like, that's in a whole day's work. Well, this is probably the longest I have ever stayed up in my life was about 49 hours. So if I match my record, we could do it. Let's start now. Technically, I mean that's, that's de- that would be yeah. dedication. When we get to and two, you would also probably the pod- kill, the podcast you would doesn't probably kill yourself. I, I might, but at least it would be recorded and it'll still go up on the internet. So remember, we're all. Well, if we all die, oh, yeah, who would put it. it up? Well, the podcast doesn't go up until Thursday anyway, so we got two days to do it. Wait, what? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> today's Tuesday. Today is Monday. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Almost Tuesday. Okay, I thought I forgot a day. What do they care? They're the internet. They yeah. Don't, they don't care no, it's this. it's actually Friday. Or... Time is, time, time time is, is wibbly wobbly. It's, it's not as you might know. It, it is wibbly wobbly. Time wibbly. Um, so, Spacey Wavy wasn't nothing. really a part of it. I don't like Spacey Wavy. I think you said that. He's... Yeah, I know. But I'm rescinding it. Does he say spacey? No, he doesn't say spacey. Eleven says spacey wacy. Yeah, eleven. Eleven. Yeah, that definitely gets. And that's where I got it from, so it's okay now. At one point, he says spacey wacy. So if you haven't figured it out by now, obviously this playlist is in relation to the uh, love of Rose and the Doctor. At least this playlist is focused on that. So, what inspired you to create the original ginormous playlist? So one day, uh, this is Sage, by the way. Hi, everybody. one day, I, well, Kim and I spend most of our days on Gchat together, mm-hmm. yelling about things um, in in all caps, etc. And one day, I Gchatted her, and I just said, "You know, if I were to make a Rose and the Doctor playlist, I would probably put Matt Nathanson's Room at the End of the World on it." And I may have been saying that because I had already started putting a playlist and, together. And then I just took the ball and was like, well, we're making a Rosen 10 playlist. You have and that moment with friends where you're like, I need to test the waters and see if they're as insane about this particular thing as I am. And then you just kind of like dip the toe. And then obviously just... I was. And we spent most of that first day just like. Adding songs, and now it's like whenever we stumble across 
a song that we think is appropriate for the playlist, one of us will email the other or whatever, and we add it to the playlist, and that's how it's 49 hours long. Well, how about this selection we're doing today? Was there any any sort of best of, or did you just sort of take what's relevant, or just kind of, uh, these are as good as any else? There were some songs that when we thought about culling it down to a best of, that we automatically were like, oh, of course it would be these songs. And then we kind of just like scrolled through and tried to pick a good cross section of what we thought was in the playlist and as opposed to like making the playlist all sad depressing ballads we threw in some pop songs and all right well i guess that'll bring me to my our our third perhaps final unless these two guys have another follow-up uh question pre getting into these songs individually because i'm sure this will vary on on song to song basis but what do you think was like the primary focus was it like lyrical content or was it more of an aesthetic feel that fit the mood so to speak I think we're, when you're talking about, I think the thing that sort of got us off and running into making this playlist and making it as long as it is, is that the, I mean, it's like, it's a really epic story. It, it's about somebody who lives forever. It's about like a regular person who, uh, who affects that person who can live forever in ways that they've never been affected before. Like, it's a very, it's a very, um, huge momentous type of thing that they have and that we were kind of responding to. And, um, there's fun in it. There's There's romance in it. There's tragedy. There's longing. There's angst. There's all of that. And, um, and I think that the, the theme that I sort of hit on as I was listening to this mixtape in particular is that we don't have any songs on here that are like, you ruined my life. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Losing you made none of any of this worth it. It's very much about, um, living in the moment and, um, and as Sarah Jane would say, some things are worth getting your heart broken for. So I think that's kind of our, it's kind of a nice mm. jumping off point, that, isn't it? Yeah. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Well done, Steve. You get a gold star this week. What did I do? <laughs> yeah, really. Why did Steve get the yeah. answer to that? You asked the question. She well. was just very poetic about everything. Was. You were very Sarah poetic, Jane. yes. Sarah Jane. My Sarah Jane. My Sarah Jane. Okay. Um, who is missed? Um, well, then I guess this is a good place to get started on the actual track by track. So this is going to be a little the, different. Well, this is the thing, though. There is a prerequisite here, and that prerequisite is, of course, kind of need to know those particular seasons of the Doctor Who. I mean, well, that's true. So obviously, we're talking about Doctor Who, the rebooted version of Doctor Who that started with Christopher Eccleston. Yes. And so this this is about the Doctor and the Rose from nine to ten. Yes, it's. I mean, really, obviously, series one and series two of the reboot, and what we can consider fanon, or you know, all, all the kind of like canon that the fans all kind of agree on, on on for things after Rose and the Doctor are separated. And then obviously when she comes back in series four, there are songs that reflect on that. And then uh, when 10 regenerates too. So it's basically that whole arc. Makes this a more more niche podcast than most perhaps. But I think it's pretty important because of the fact that we're talking about the the assembly of a playlist, which always has some specific purpose. In this particular case, that's the purpose. And, uh, if I if there was only a way to like add to, you know we usually put Spotify play buttons with everything in order to link people to the album yeah. if only was a way to link people to those entire two seasons like a Netflix play button <laughs> yeah <laughs> that would be that awesome would be that would be very be. appropriate you could just no just include the link to the wiki there you go you could there do that go. the wiki yeah, of right. the, the, the spoiler, seasons spoiler summaries and whatnot yeah oh. yeah, okay. yeah but see, no. we don't want people to be spoiled if you haven't watched it yeah. you, you should see, that's the thing that would take away not, from the aesthetic feel yes you, you can't you have to watch the show to understand like how these songs tie into it you can't just but, but it, it, I'm of the opinion that if you're not already a Whovian you have no excuse so too bad if you spoil it for yourself, Alex, that's too bad. Illusionary. unbelievable. I mean, no, I, I got care. through, and I, you know, and I didn't start watching Doctor Who until two years ago. Yeah, same. and I, I mean, I wasn't spoiled on any of it. I mean, I knew obviously that Rose left, but I didn't know the circumstances, and so it's so much more effective when you know well, the no, circumstances. No, even where I'm coming from is my memory of the series of the se- those particular seasons are is sort of scant at best at this particular time because it was years ago that I watched it. So I'm sort of going off a vague memory of it. 
Yeah, but even so, I, I like I was brought back to the time in several of these songs, and we'll talk about that as we come here. And also, uh, just you know, you could from any particular series, any major love story that goes on, you could always extrapolate that and extrapolate that into any transform it into any other epic love story. Oh perhaps. yeah, I mean we kind of have made a Mulder and Scully playlist too and there there's some crossover. I might have a, wait, I have wait, a jo- wait, I have a Josh and Donna Can playlist. We do that podcast that has, instead? No, I mean you <laughs> have us back for the Have us back and we'll talk about Mulder and Scully all we want to cuz that was both of our first forays into fandom. I'll put that in the footnote. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of crossover with kind of these cuz those are the love stories on TV shows that Sage and I both respond to, and I think that's what a lot of people respond to. So, well, particularly as any that lasts the the length of a series, yeah, that you're not really sure whether it's meant to be at all until at some point. Oh. No, we were sure it was meant to be with oh, Modern Scully uh, from the pilot. <laughs> but again, we'll go away from Modern Scully right now. <laughs> For now. For now. We'll get it. All right. So, track one, we have Matt Nathanson at. The at symbol room at it's the end room of the world. It's room at the end of the world. This room at the end of the world, okay. Yeah. With the at symbol. Um, so, so, yes, you said this was one of the songs that uses your jumping off point to actually broach the topic of creating a playlist. So yes. clearly it has important weight in this playlist. I mean, this is one of those songs that is a solid start to this playlist. Whether it's intended to be in this order or not, it worked out very well because it was very much a sweet, nice song that was very catchy about... Pretty much what you come to expect between the Doctor and Rose. I mean, Matt Nathanson himself, when you see him in concert, he calls this song, and it's like in a phrase of, what would you want to do if the world were ending? You would want to get into the room with the person you love, and he always uses the metaphor of playing Scrabble, but we all really know what What he he means. means. Sure. (laughs) But yeah, and that's obviously, like, and Rose and the Doctor literally travel to the end of the world, too, so we kind of put it on the nose there. <laughs> but at the same time, it does have sort of, um, a feel of the music has sort of like a, a kind of premonition of the conflict that is inherent in the Doctor Who. And this is why I really enjoyed it as a starting point. Because for any Whovians out there, and anyone who really watches a lot of British television, <laughs> tragedy is a staple. Even in oh, the yeah. comics, tragedy yes. is a staple. <laughs> because nothing is more emotional than a good tragic hero, a good tragic story whether love or not and th- i i heard it in in the actual lyrics not the lyrics the vocals and the music it really did a it did it it got me ready for what i knew was going to be a sad ending um what didn't you know uh, the british invented tragedy al gore invented the internet and and british, <laughs> british invented tra- tragedy, tragedy. I yeah, hear could some say the greeks but you know the two different types of i hear what you're yeah. saying though because i think that um in some of in some of the songs that we've chosen that there's this uh maybe what what you're hearing what the lyrics the lyrics that you're hearing is sort of the what the doctor would want to do if he didn't have any responsibility if he didn't feel any responsibility so in this song when i hear him saying you know we'll get a room at the end of the world and we'll just hide ourselves away and I won't have anything to do with it when you know that if the doctor were in that kind of situation he would obviously he be would do fixing something. the problem he yeah. would be the hero and he would do he 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 wouldn't do what um I mean he would he wouldn't do something just for himself he's tried but he's never he's tried and he can't so do it so I hear that kind of like push and pull in those lyrics where it's not necessarily what he would actually do in that situation. Well, let, let's jump over to the aesthetic really quickly here, because uh, I, I wasn't the first to say it before, but Matt pointed out that uh, this does have a little bit of a nine, generic 90s pop kind of feel, but of course that's the that's thing. It, th- I feel like here this was more about lyrical content, in which case I definitely do see that. But, um, I don't know. Well, listen, I mean, I, I might have overstated it in the beginning a little bit, but it reminded me of a lot of... Uh, lighter rock bands that I listened to in the 90s. Um, there there have been bands that have done this then and now, and I'm not saying that it's not special. I mean, what really stood out to me about this song was the lyrics. But also, in a playlist that's an emotional connection to either another person or a fandom, or honestly, whatever you're connecting a playlist to, if it's emotion-driven, if there are lyrics, they're going to be a part, part, part of it. You're not going to have an emotional playlist and the lyrics not have anything to do with it. It just yeah, it wouldn't true. really work. Yeah, but I think Steve can, can refute you a little bit, and I would refute you a little bit on that. A lot of times it's also the setting of the music as well. 
And well, that's... yes, I'm saying I'm not saying that the setting of the music doesn't matter. I'm just saying that the lyrics are very important when talking about a theme if lyrics are involved. Oh, okay, setting, okay. setting is definitely tough because, of course, we don't have a lot of uh, Gallifrey uh, mm-hmm. space rock going on, all the space pop, for instance. It's kind of tough. <laughs> uh, so there actually it... is a whole genre, of like Gallifrey a fan music. created genre. Of like, very I'm much not like the Wizard Rock, right? Thing. Yeah, yeah no, there is. I forget what it's called. What's the. Like the big band in it called. I can't remember their uh, name. It's. I'll think of it. But but like yeah. how how we talked in the past that Harry Potter has it is those like Rock, totally. very Harry Potter themed punk bands. Right, the, and then, of course they go straight over to punk, which is yeah. like that's not really anywhere there in. in but the there are story, some rock bands that that mimic the aesthetic of Doctor Who and only okay. sing about Doctor Who. Well, even one of the only reasons I even mentioned the the well, one of the reasons I agree with you with the '90s generic, but partially because of the little pi- piano accentuations like within this, which I noticed was kind of a running theme throughout this. There's sometimes it worked with me a little more than others, but at this particular moment, I, I I was kind of with it, at least in terms of an intro. It was, it, it's the kind of thing that sort of sits on the peripheral. So a lot of times you want to sort of focus on the lyrics when it comes to these kinds of tracks because it's very verse and chorus oriented but at the same time those that piano sort of ties everything together it's yeah. the constant there which is it, i mean w- was kind of the purpose of the piano in a lot of these po- a lot of pop tracks of the era not necessarily these but mm-hmm. of the era Piano was used in a way to link these very pop songs and I mean, kind of give it, it a through line. I kind of laugh that you say this is a very '90s song because that song came out in 2010. Right. <laughs> so, well, I, I, mean, see, you know, I would make a little argument that there's certain little habits that we have. I mean, the sure, it can be '90s esque, but I just want yeah. to clarify that the song did not come out in the '90s. No, yes, Fair enough. of course. <laughs> and I knew that. It's just it's a sound that was familiar to me from from the rock I listened to in the '90s, the pop rock rather. Um. We can, and I think now safely, move on to the next song, track two, which is A Thousand Years, which is Christina Perry. Yep. Is that right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Christina Perry. That's right. I can't remember how I'm running at the time. Um, so, obviously, this one, the title is very on the nose, A Thousand Years. It's very much about the life of, this, of the doctor and how long he lives and what he experiences. And this moment in time where he experiences someone very different. Whereas Rose and this focal point within this vast. We'll see. Here's the thing. Now this get. Now we can get back to like the, the organization of this playlist. Because I, I, I mean, from my personal standpoint, one could argue that at least as of track one, it's a little more like, all right, that that's what, for instance, you, our guests, that's what you saw here. Track one, it would be hard for me to like sort of connect the aesthetic. But track two, I think, is far more universal, and I really, really see that. Obviously, because you're talking about the breadth of time now, mm-hmm. that connects very closely with the epic nature of the. Of the the character and the relationship they're in, um, also it was it was really kind of in the feel of the song itself. I really love these sw- string swells all throughout. The orchestration is just beautiful throughout this entire song. And again, we have piano punctuation, but this was a little bit more on the positive side of things, more toward uh, single notes instead of just flat out like chords heavy mm-hmm. on certain moments. Instead, just little one key notes here and there, which is very you know it's simple but it's tasteful. Really fit with the grand orchestration. You feel the breadth of time. Yeah, and originally, I mean, people will know that that song's from the Twilight movies, but it's way more appropriate for Doctor Who, so oh. we stole it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we rescued it. We rescued it from uh, Ella, Ella, uh, Bella, Ella and Edward. Edward. We yeah. rescued it from them. And uh, I honestly, I'd never heard the song before uh, listening to this. I had no idea it was from Twilight. And it, it, I almost thought it was Taylor Made. The way the phrasing, the wording, and everything like that is Taylor Made is, I don't know, maybe if not Doctor Who, then like the Time Traveler's Wife or something like that. Like it's giving that kind of idea. It, I don't see how it sits with the whole vampire sparkliness. <laughs> and no, it's a very uh, positive thing that I that I don't remember kind of, that from Twilight. It's kind yeah. of sad. Yeah. I don't. Which one was it in? It was in Breaking Dawn. It was their wedding song. It's what she... Uh, yes, it's sad that I know this. It's what she uh, walked down the aisle to. And then in the fourth movie, which was Breaking Dawn Part 2, it kind of played as like a coda to the whole series uh. and like showed a montage of their relationship. But it's all like, you know, Edward is a thousand years old. Well, see, that's the thing. Because of Whatever. the whole subculture that yeah. followed upon the whole Twilight thing, it... it they tended to connect like every single song there was like oh that's it, it it's conne- intertwined with the twilight saga the biggest 
case I have of that was uh, the Claire de Lune, which is that that uh, light classical piece, the um, more of a romantic impressionist, like the Debussy piece, mm -hmm. and th that was the love song right there. That mm -hmm. was that was their anthem. And it's like that's a hundred year old thing. It's been used right? for months, but, but and now yeah. all of a sudden, every single everyone in this generation is going to remember Twilight. the Claire de Lune, this beautiful piano. That's that's Twilight. I won't. So, so you got mm -hmm. that thankfully, you. thankfully, this was not tied in, and mm -hmm. I just could accept this easily as part of this playlist. It does <laughs> feel tailor made. I agree. And this was a song also by an artist like the first track that I had never really heard before, but I really liked, um, and I liked the artist, and I'm interested to hear more by the artist. I think it was beautiful. She has a fantastic song called Jar of Hearts mm -hmm. that was kind of her breakthrough, mm -hmm. and it was actually used on So You Think You Can Dance, and it kind of catapulted her. No one knew who she no was. No one knew who she and was. She was a and friend this. of one of the choreographers. And the choreographer just said, can I use your song? And it was this amazing performance, and it and, took and her it off. And it catapulted her to where, I mean, she is now, writing songs for Twilight. Well, she's got that great <laughs> sort of raspy quality to her voice, yeah. which sounds, which I like juxtaposed with this sort of big sweeping love yeah. And yet, yeah. even with that, there's also sort of a comedic connection here, especially within certain of the certain lines. Just, and all, and all along I believed I would find you, time has brought your heart to me. <laughs> I mean, it, it's so on the nose. It's so on the nose, it, but it's so it perfect. Makes it funny. It's so yeah. perfect. So, would you have to? I, I mean, love you for a thousand years more. Right, but also when making a playlist, some of those on the nose moments are some of the be best moments. They're it's required. Really that, that that connection piece that links everything else together that might be well, a little I mean, bigger. Like I said, when Sage and I were putting this together, there were some songs that it was like we can't have an ultimate. Doctor and Rose playlist without this song, song and it yeah. turns out to be some of the ones that you would say are on the nose, but it wouldn't be acceptable without. Well, and them. again, right, it's the juxtaposition of the of the lyrics with what you actually know to be true in the canon of the show, where you're talking about a thousand years. I'm going to love you for a thousand years. Well, guess what? No, you're not. Rose Tyler's not going to live for a thousand years. Yeah, she's a human. So you're you're presenting this like perfect idyllic future and knowing at the same time that It'll that's not possible. No, but at the same time you also got the character who can in fact live that long. And he does and love her for yeah. that many and he, yeah. he, he can do that. <laughs> yeah. And it's like and well he miserable. can go through on that so um, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. on your nose but come on he, he can he can actually make good on this. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, oh, I love uh, it. <laughs> the next track that we're, we'll talk about is actually a band that we've reviewed on the podcast before. So track three is The Man Who Can't Be Moved by The Script. This is from their first record. Um, we reviewed their third record, which was sort of in the middle on, for most of us. Um, As we went back, they got a lot better. But <laughs> this is from their first record, which I've heard quite a bit from their first and second record, and I really actually enjoyed the song a lot. I hadn't heard it before this playlist, but but it's a really great song. What made you pick this song for the playlist? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were both just listening to things, and it brought up very specific visual images from the series, is why we picked it, because you kind of listened to it, and you're like, the man who can't be moved, how's that the doctor? Like, come on. But we just had very strong images of... <clears throat> David Tennant's last scene in The End of Time where he goes back to visit Rose before she's met him and it's like back to the corner where I first saw you and it just it kind of thematically resonated with their love story and so that's why we put it on there. And <laughs> also it also uh, speaks up a little bit to the the way uh, especially the Tenth Doctor was where he has a line drawn in the sand. He is a kind of a pillar in in the story. He is a very much a not unchanging but uncompromising un you know what okay. Yeah. Yeah. Help yeah. Me. yeah. Adjectives. No, no, Help no, no, me. this is great. You're, uh, it's, compromising it's, the he's pillar, not, I love this. Yeah. He's not he's not a, a character that you can sway. When it comes to what he feels is right and the way he should get something done, yeah. it's very difficult to sway the tenth doctor. He and cannot yeah. be moved in the sense that he is not as like the eleventh doctor it, it it became less and less as the doctors went on. The eleventh doctor was malleable to a point. Yeah. Um but nine and ten were more this is how it's gonna be, and that's it. it yeah. Even nine though had moments of great sway. Like when the doctor dances and episodes like that where he's not, he's completely unchanged on everything he feels except I mean, this tenth, one thing. The tenth doctor is so angsty in yeah. his burden of being the time lord. Yeah. 
and I mean, more that, so than the other more so than anyone are. else he just holds that burden really really onto it so tightly and so that can definitely also thematically be sewn through this song you know well. and also there's also the visual image of again literally on the nose the doctor and the rose in uh, uh, the stolen earth and their big epic seeing each other at the yeah. end of the block and her coming and she you know she knew she'd find him and she's running to him they're and just, just like, Full, Full out, out running. running romantic thing, and then he gets shot by a doll. Like it's terrible. Yeah, but yeah, that's just like thematically. We saw those scenes when we listened to this song, and so that's why it got put on the playlist. Yeah, and even though there's not necessarily, a, we already started with this by saying that there's not necessarily an order to these particular tracks. There does almost end up being some because I feel like yeah, you're totally all, you're kind of exploring <laughs> like. Yeah, I mean, no, this is peripheral because this is not anything that you planned. But at the same point, as you're going through these, it's nice to be exposed to the setting first. And I feel like we're getting the setting. This is character development. Man, mm-hmm. not cannot be moved. That's nice. The pillar of, of a sort of self-imposed morality. Which the, oh. explains the doctor oh, pretty much that. to I yeah, love that description. This is, <laughs> Good all job. That, uh, <laughs> um, from the script, we move to a band that I has one of the more depressing songs for me. And it's not necessarily because the song itself is very depressing. It's just how it's presented. And, and, and it's a sweet depression. So the song is called I Will Follow You Into the Dark by Death Cab for Cutie. I'd heard this ages and ages ago. Um, and it's this story of the idea that if you go, I will follow. Even if you're dying, I will go with you on that journey too. And it's it's a beautifully sweet story. And obviously in Doctor Who, they're is a lot of that feeling, too, with A, the Doctor regenerating, B, um, um, companions being separated from the Doctor or leaving the Doctor, the Doctor leaving them, like in the case of Rose and the Doctor, how they're separated by a wall, and so much more, but essentially just separated by a wall. In parallel universes. In parallel universes. Well, it it comes down to that the the culmination of so many stories of, of the Doctor is... Him on the brink of the abyss, staring into it and saying no. That's what he does. That's his job in the universe. Um, And this is Rose saying, well, you're not alone. Or any companion. Then this is one of those songs that really kind of transcends um, not just where the newer series, but the older stuff as well. Mm. This This is the story of the Doctor as told from the companion's point of view. It is that guy who's about to do something that's both stupid, dangerous, and honorable. But, you know, and he's always alone. And he's for thousands of years, he's always alone. And the only thing you're really getting in the actual series is those snapshots of his actual life when he's interacting with humanity, whether it's actually humans or aliens or whatnot. It's when he's actually interacting with people. And this is, this is that, that carry-on call for that. And I, this was one of my favorite songs on the on the actual uh, 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 playlist you guys created. And the other reason was because it's Death Cab for Cutie, and I haven't heard them in about <laughs> ten years. Uh, back when I was still in high school, now college that's, era. That's the and that was, was another thing too. that really got nostalgic for me. Well, nostalgic for me is a little more recent, because for me that was all over college. And everyone thought of Ben Gibbard as this, this introspective god of... of of introspectivity. Like, he was that introverted personality. His poetry, it speaks to me. It speaks to everyone at the same time. So it's almost... Yeah, I, I feel like I called this. That's the first track. Mm-hmm. I was like, Death Cab's gonna be on here. It's gonna be yeah. on this song. It's on, track it's on it every fan mix of Doctor Who yeah. that's out there. Because we did kind of scour the internet when we were first building the playlist for fan right. mixes for inspiration. And pretty much... Every Doctor Who mix has that song on there. I think it's true. when we were listening to it initially, and you looked at me and you said, "This is when she says, I made my decision a long time ago, and I'm never going to leave you.'" And she says it so matter of factly, and he says, "You're never going to see your mother again. You're never going to see your father again. You're never going to see your friends again." And she's like, "Well, that's that's just the that's way it's my choice, be. and that's and it's and it's her choice, and it's very calm, and it's very." Uh, and the it's way very he... unchanging, and that's the way that this song sounds to me, where it doesn't sound... It, there's no despair in this song, I don't think. It is sad. It is about following somebody into into their own destruction or whatever, but 
it's very contented and almost almost happy to do so. And there's yeah. that line, there's the verse where he's talking about going to Catholic school. Catholic school is vicious as Roman rule. Yeah. Um, and he mm. says, uh, I held my tongue as she told me, son, fear is the heart of love, so I never went back. Yeah. And if there's anything that is the complete antithesis to Doctor Who. It's fear is the heart of love. It's the complete opposite. Yeah. Um, well, it's almost why I have this love-hate relationship with Ben Gibbard, because, or Death Cab in general, because of the fact that they, they explore the medium so well, I feel like they can almost be appropriate for everything mm-hmm. in some ways. So it strikes me as almost just a little bit of a safe time. At the same point, it worked. It definitely worked easily. Um, but, you know, it's just that, that idea that maybe maybe the novelty is, is starting to fade off a little bit for me uh, with Death Cab at the same... I don't know. It's, it, it really did work, especially considering uh, its placement here. But it almost made me want to see this as more of a... Uh, oh, how do you call it? Like a, like a Barnes & Noble type, type feel. A Barnes & Noble <laughs> soundtrack. It's just like, you know what? This is going to appease everyone. No matter what <laughs> section of the story Well, yeah, because even if we, if we had not had Death Cab on there, you would have been like... Uh, where's Death Cab? Yeah. You yes, know? that's that's what I would have. I would have come here. Like, where the where hell was is like Death really? Cab? You didn't have any Death Cab on here, so it, it was necess- necessary. Well, another thing that I think for the for me for this song though that made it extra sad for me is the song "I Will Follow You Into the Dark." This idea that she will follow him anywhere, mm-hmm. but if you know the series, you know eventually she can't anymore, mm-hmm. and that's what but really she gets would have. me. She would have, but the universe stops her. And yeah. and that's what I think truly made it sad for me, is that's where my brain went. I'll follow you in the dark, except I can't. Yeah. No, the, the lyrics are really beautiful here, especially with... Um, was, was this, I think this was the chorus. If, if heaven and hell decide that yeah. they are both satisfied, illuminate the nose on, your, on, your va- on their vacancy signs. If there's no one beside you, when your soul embarks, then I'll follow you into the dark. It's very, it's beautiful. And this is what Ben Gibbard has been doing for, for years and years and years. And some people see it, some people don't. At the same, I mean, sometimes I feel it's just like the music itself beneath it is a little bit safe. Because he says these very, very powerful lines, and I feel like maybe this, this, this sort of four chord progression type song could have gone a little bit further with, a little punchier. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, what are you going to do? This song is... Oh, Reorchestrate it. That's yeah. right. I will. I will it. take on that challenge. You should do it. You should do it. Please. Every album of Death Can. <laughs> Except Plans, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, and now now we get to, on the first time on this playlist, look to the cosmos itself with a song called Stars, which we knew we'd get something like that at some point. This is by Grace Potter and the Nocturnals, who I'm, I wasn't familiar with before this playlist. Um, this song, I thought, was beautiful. I mean, I just, I really love the imagery from the song. I mean, and from the moment you read the title, Stars, the Galaxy. The Doctor. I mean, you know, time and space are the, the two the, things. The news, yeah. But yes. then it's such a sad song. Yeah. It is such a sad song. The, the idea of looking to the stars, and every time I look to the stars, I think of you. Well, and if I know you at all, I think I know you've gone too far. We yeah. were, like, whispering That's while we were listening to it, because it's like, what would Rose be thinking of his actions in the waters of Mars? Yeah, exactly. And those kind of things, because she knows that the Doctor, and, and a lot of his companions know this. I mean, Donna Noble says it, Amy Pond says it. The Doctor needs a companion. Because he needs the human companion to kind of ground him and keep him from getting the power drunk that he gets in yeah. the waters of Mars. Yeah. And that's why... The song is so sad because you just imagine Rose standing on a beach looking up at the stars and knowing that the doctor needs her. Well, and, and you get mm. that wailing within the song itself. Yeah. Because this yeah. had the most powerful chorus at this point in, in, in the playlist. Because you start off with this very ethereal tone and then it develops and develops. And as soon as that chorus punches, I actually didn't expect it. Because again, I'm coming off of Barnes and Noble type, you know. Mm. And then the second that first punch hits with stars and it's she very. She can't look she, at them. She can belt that. Yeah. Really, she can though. Um, that's, it's, it's really, it's powerful. It really is. Well, yeah, and I see that comparison to Waters of Mars. Because of all the movies, because they did so many movies with Tenet, you know, mm-hmm. those so, so many specials, that one was one of the most powerful mm-hmm. for me because you saw Eccleston's doctor in Tenet mm-hmm. in those moments, oh, too, because yeah. Eccleston was the angry doctor. You know, he had moments of brightness, but 
and ultimately came around to not being as angry. But in the early episodes, he was very fresh off the time war, angry, disgruntled, and you get a sense of that in Waters of Mars, that other doctor. That's I mean, you in really there. get because he's called the oncoming storm all yeah. this time, and you really see it in the in Waters that, of Mars. And like, the, he's terrifying, right? In that scene where he decides that he's going to do whatever he wants, he's absolutely terrifying. It shows Tennant's real. I mean, he's ton of acting chops, but really that craziness that he shows in that moment, and then how it still ends with her dying, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that 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 movie still and the history finds a way to correct itself. Mm-hmm. Really there, shows the futility of this. Shows him like a, an angry kid with a water, water gun. Right. You know, in that moment. And there are so many times in those two seasons where Rose kind of just stands in front of him while he's showing that kind of anger. Not to that degree, necessarily. Yeah. But where she just stands in front of him and says, what are you going to do? It's not the one pointing the gun at me. And Dalek, yeah. like, you know, yeah. where she yeah. just, like, she stands up to that. She yeah. knows it. She recognizes it. And in a way that I don't think any of the other companions really have because none of them really knew nine. Yeah. Um, she well, has the, an understanding of that part of his personality. The the uh, the big thing about the Doctor is he's... Because the character is just so old, and this is one of the reasons why I, I think the writers of the show can do is just great magic with it. It's Once you reach, you know, centuries old, think of that. Everybody you know dies. Everything you know changes. And couple that with time travel and everything like that, you lose your morals. And that's what the companion is needed for on the show itself. He, it, It's his moral... Uh, it grounds him in, exactly. in at least that time's but morality. So that yeah. was actually how they introduced, uh, uh, introduced Matt Smith as a doctor, was re- showing him rediscovering that he's not just a uh, an a-hole. He is... <laughs> like, he's a dangerous individual, and that was, like, the main theme, but... He's also has capacity for good, but he only really has this when he has somebody to show him it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's one of the things that was uh, it makes the companion the more important character in a lot of the storylines because without the companion, you know, the, the big red button gets pushed, everything mm-hmm. gets blown up, the bad guys just get destroyed. I, I have to quote um, what Matt Smith said to us. <laughs> Sorry, true story. We interviewed him one time, uh, and he was talking about the relationship between the Doctor and the Companion, and um, he's talking, of course, about how important it is and what you're saying about grounding him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he said, sh- showing like traveling the universe is so different to showing the universe to somebody and letting them experience it with you, and so just this just this calling that he has to be like, look how cool this is. It's almost just that, in gen- that like very, very, very simply that keeps yeah. him going. Is, is that like, there's so many people, people who I get to show this stuff to, yeah. mm-hmm. and what's it worth if you're by yourself? Yeah. Nothing. Better with two? Better with two. Oh, stop. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, there's actually that, uh, one more thing about this song, just in the musical end, is that mm-hmm. because it actually has a little bit more of a, a country feel, Grace Potter stuff mm-hmm. is just a little bit country esque. Yeah, and then um, I think that just that setting alone, you, you when you think of a country sound, you think of an open field. You think of an mm-hmm. open field, you think of the most beautiful starry night you can possibly imagine, which is the greatest setting from an earthly, worldly perspective to view the stars or think about that. So. I liked it. Yay! <laughs> <That reason. laughs> um, we now go on to what might be one of Steve's favorite songs on the playlist, I'm guessing. Well, it, you know, it's in a little bit of a weird trio here, because it started to get very, very dark at this point. This is Snow Patrol set the fire to the third bar. Yes, and it's featuring Martha Wainwright. Ah, oh, featuring Martha Wainwright. Well, this is... this. I feel like this was the good point, at least in the, this playlist, which has no order, but we're applying an order to it anyway, <laughs> because it started to actually go through, down this little uh, dark path. In other words, the, you know, the midst of, of conflict, as it were, or at least starting to explore the problems that exist here. Because there was this constant duet throughout the song, which I really, really liked. I don't think at any point in this track they stop speaking together, right. which is very important in terms of establishing some kind of bond And it's always here. just in that harmony, too. Exactly. Um, also, I like the tone a little bit more. Again, getting further away from pop, this was a little bit more toward a sort of post-rock atmosphere where the guitars are being used as, as uh, sort of placeholders for an ambient setting. So establishing like really, really thick, ethereal setting. And then 
the funny thing is that it doesn't really go anywhere, and I liked it for that exact reason. It doesn't jerk you back and forth between verse chorus. Oh, we're going to have this breakout moment. Mm -hmm. Not that. Instead, let's just sit and explore one particular area. So they, it's fairly stagnant the entire time, and it makes it somewhat unnerving by the end, which is... A nice th- it's emotion very to explore. atmospheric. I feel yeah. like and it was. It was the percussion that really got to me. The percussion and the and the piano work were deeply emotional. Even though, I mean, they weren't jazz. They weren't like monstrously complicated with all the little notes all over the page and just ink just splattered everywhere. They were very steady, but it was the variance, the variation between the piano work and the <clears throat> percussion work that really, at this point. In, in this song, honestly, I I loved it for the vocals and the music. I I would have enjoyed whatever they were singing. Mm-hmm. At this point, I was not even paying attention to the lyrics. This is just, it feels, it's got that darkness, it's got that fear to it. Well, that's an and effect you can achieve by being tonally complacent. Yeah. Because, you know, as soon as you start going back and forth, you're going to be sort of drawn out of that atmosphere. And that sort of, you know, is, has a you have a hard time anchoring yourself throughout any playlist or album when that's the case. So the fact that it, you just immersed in that one one moment for the entirety of the song is really, really relaxing. And you can't focus. Well, you can We've actually out. talked about that before in a lot of other albums. Um, a, a song that does its best to try to capture a moment within a minute to four to 15 to whatever. And there's been a couple of songs that, that we've reviewed. Um, one of my favorites is actually Evergreen uh, from Scale the Summit. And it is... To me, I can't listen to that song without just going and just having one long sigh because it is like an instance for me. And this, I was getting that same sort of feeling here, and it was just. Well, what was funny for us listening to it on a very good sound system just now <laughs> is that I leaned over to Sage and I was like, "You can almost hear the Doomsday theme." In this, which the theme from the actual show, mm-hmm. in the way that because that theme is another one that's very the same note over and over and over and over again, right. and I was like, it's kind of creepy because it feels very, it feels very doomsday. In, this m- might be in a it. case for that reason that the aesthetic connection was a little bit stronger here than maybe the lyrical connection. But mm-hmm. the lyrical connection, it's there. I see it, especially in the choruses, if you can call them choruses, because again, mm-hmm. there's not too much variation in it's tone. It's just between. like a refrain, right? Exactly, and it's just I'm miles from where you are. I lay down on the cold ground and I I pray that something picks us up, picks me up, and sets me down in your warm arms. It's 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 obviously you feel the distance there, but you know distance could be applied almost to anyone. So it's a little bit of a sense. I do see it. Like mm-hmm. I I feel it, and but because I'm already in that place aesthetically, I, I can accept it lyrically. I like the first um, the lyrics of the very first verse where it starts. I. F- I find the map and draw a straight line over rivers, farms, and state lines. The distance from A to where you'd be is only finger lengths that I see, and I thought that that was... See, that's a more... I mean, in the in in the grand scheme of his long, long life, it's this far, really, but yeah. it smiles at the yeah. same time. Um, well, and also that idea awesome. of the stagnation of the song making an uneasy feeling. There are many moments in Doctor Who where... The doctor's silence is scary. Yeah. When he says something, you can usually find humor, comfort, solace, something. But in the doctor's silence in many of the seasons is some of his scariest moments where he speaks low or doesn't speak at all. Mm -hmm. And that kind of letting go of the lyrics and just accepting this as silence almost Mm -hmm. and focusing on the music Mm -hmm. really can phase that kind of eeriness too in that stagnation. You know, there's a funny one in the second verse, which, which I feel like at first glance could probably seem a little bit disconnected, but at the same time, it's kind of nice. I hang my coat up in the first bar. There is no peace that I've found so far. The laughter penetrates my silence as drunken men find flaws in science. <laughs> I feel like on the first glance, okay, yeah, yeah all right, You're in a bar, probably not connected. At the same time, finding flaws in silence is a lot of, I mean, the people they encounter along the route, I feel oh, like yeah. a lot of times that's... You're constantly dealing... She's dealing with that. Yeah. You know, half the time. So, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess sort of on a second listen, this was a lot better to me. At least um, lyrically. Mm-hmm. Lyrically. Because I was already there. The rest. Musically. And I right. did like what the... This actually did, because it, it was a perfect predecessor for Satellite Call, which was... By Sarah Bros. Which was just one of the biggest... 
like it was almost a callback to Bad Wolf. It was a, a great representation of Bad Wolf, which was the the theme, the underlying conflict of the uh, Doctor Rose uh, duality that was going on. Was just for <coughs> what four seasons? Just yeah. Bad Wolf. Just throw it in here. Throw mm-hmm. it in there. The most random things, and nobody really made anything till you know the fifteenth, sixteenth time time they've seen it. This does a great job of representing how that was done, um, especially that really, really echoey voice, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very, like very heavy being, reverb being throughout. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything here, Somewhere. which is spoilers. spreading stars across. Yeah, yeah. to yeah. lead her way back to the doctor. Well, well, see, that's another thing. thing. Like the whole spoilers. It's what it is. is. What she did. <laughs> yeah, this song, very similar to the last one, has again that sort of dark feel. At the same time, you're able to find a song that explores almost the same same feeling but with totally different texture. Mm-hmm. Instead, really, you get a lot more openness here than just pure darkness. Well, and what's with the lyric that's, like, sending out so you know that there's someone that loves you here on the ground? On the ground like, yeah. that's, you know, I love... That was the lyric this that so you know stuck out yeah. to us. Is this is so you know the sound of someone who loves you here on the ground. Which is the whole idea behind... Of her, her yeah, desperately work. trying to get back well, to him. The, the big, big bad evil guy. Was, yeah. The exact opposite of the big, big bad evil guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's... Yeah. it's one of the, the one of the my favorite parts in any story ever, yeah. That, that uh, uh, revelation, and the way it's presented here, it does a great job of basically summing up the whole idea. I mm. just love it. I like the fact that it sounded like she was singing in like a concrete hallway or something yeah. like that. It was that level of reverb. Oh, the production strong. on the song is yeah. really Which, excellent. Yeah, Even though the chorus is just for the, singing yeah. the concrete hallway. It's just yeah. for singing ooh throughout the entire chorus. Mm-hmm. At the same time, it's like the most beautiful ooh you ever heard. Well, it's those amazing, because as we were listening to it, you were like, are those thirds? Are those alternating thirds? Oh, that's and right. Just... Within that chorus, yeah. you know, the ooh, you know it's, a, it's a very varying ooh. It's yeah. me saying ooh doesn't quite do it But justice. it's very specific. Exactly. It's just this climbing in Intervals, which sort of reaching out toward the sky, which you can almost within, see, like the yeah. sound, the sound bands going out. She's is what reaching it, to. It's like a siren almost. It is. I love it. <laughs> Next, we'll move on to "If Only I" by John McLaughlin. Yeah. Okay, good. I got it right. <laughs> um, sometimes I struggle with names and words and everything. Anyway. This song um, was is the last song we get before we get a shock to the system <laughs> in the ninth track of the yeah. playlist. Oh, but it. but uh, <laughs> if only I was also was it, it, it's a little lighter than the last three or four songs that we had. It's still not. Uh, it's not I as. Don't know about that. No. Yeah. No. no. See, we interpret no. it. Yeah. We interpret it as completely uh, devastating. I, I, I was with you there. I was pretty devastated. Sad, <laughs> low depression and reflection. That's the. That's. The I guess song. I just that's did, what it, it didn't have the eeriness that the other tracks. No, but no, how it was, no, I think this actually was eerie in the fact that it was so steady again. In this case, it was actually steadier than we got back with the Snow Patrol song. Okay. This is even more just trapped. You know. Not not in the same way where just because you're not going back and forth between verse and chorus, but you're literally just trapped here because it's so static. And it's the whole concept of but. But I can't. Right. But I could. But it, yeah. it's the idea of regret. And that that in and of itself is, yes, not eerie because this is a very human emotion as yeah. opposed to, you know... Daleks or what have you, Cybermen. Pick, pick, pick a villain Cybermen of the week. Cybermen don't have emotions. Duh, that's why they're Cybermen. That's not true. There, there's, <laughs> there's been those options. But like this, this not eerie, but still unsettling. This is just you can identify with, and that's where the 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 sadness, actually, the the fear will come in. Well, yeah, it was by no means positive. Let me, <laughs> let me say that. You it got was. like one or two positive it, songs it, here. It, it, it was. Like I, mix, I swear, yeah. when you read these lyrics, it's it's so on the nose at times, it is downright hilarious. We're past just like, oh, it's a little comedic here from a, you know, uh, academic perspective. People say love is hell, a shiny prison cell where time stops. The TARDIS. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> pretty, it's pretty damn on point. Um, but in general, again, this is sort of when I was I was I was, I was trapped with the song. So I, I liked the feel of it. I liked the aesthetic. I could kind of take or leave the lyrics at times. But that's just it, it's I don't know. Again, the lyrics are kind of secondary to me sometimes. Mm. Aesthetic comes for, from from there first and foremost. And this is uh, like 
here was created a unified playlist, and when you get into a playlist, you can't do too much of one thing. Because uh, if you go to depression, well, unless you're actually making a playlist of depression, mm-hmm. you start going into a spiral. And we're yep. having a lot of, you know, eerie, sad, depressing, scary kind of things See, they're, going on. They're bold enough to use the word epic in the beginning. And when you explore an epic, you need to explore all the highs and the lows. Because that's how breathy an epic is. I mean, personally, I love, you know, Tragic Heroes, Hamlet, Give It. You know, I love retelling stories like that. But every once in a while, you need a, <coughs> mo- a moment of brevity. And we get our moment <laughs> <laughs> in E.T. Yes. yes. E.T. by Katy Perry featuring Kanye West. And Seem there's... bizarre to anybody? <laughs> Just considering the last few songs, it is bizarre. Of course, this is that moment where if we were doing an album, this would be the moment that we would probably write off, perhaps, as an intermission. Because, again, we're going f- toward really strongly on-the-nose lines here in terms of just placement. <laughs> and I had to ask you before, and I'm going to ask you again Do on it. air. Ask us on air. Did you feel like you just needed something dirty in here? It wasn't I'm that it's, specifically it's not, in this. It's not that it's necessarily dirty. I mean, it is kind of dirty. Oh, it's kind of dirty. it's not dirty. that it's we kinda... don't have other dirty songs on. Well, right. Of course, we'll just have a sample playlist. of the grand playlist here. But I mean this I mean this is kind of one that this was actually one that we never even debated about putting on the playlist. It was like, oh yeah, ET has to be on there. And uh and of course, we think it's a fun song and it kind of and we were saying when we were listening to it, there are fan videos out there that really like cemented it for us as far as like being Rose and the Doctor or just being Doctor Who in general. So, but and and what you were saying before about the famine, which is that you know, I mean, there's there's plenty of of Doctor Rose content. There's plenty of story that has been fleshed out in between episodes, after episodes, pre episodes, whatever. And um, and this is kind of like, kind of a little shout out to that in terms of people think this way. Yeah, we. We do. That they were doing it in the TARDIS. All the time. All the time. On the console. Everywhere. (laughs) All right, let's just get it out. It's a fantasy. It is a fantasy. It is. It's a fantasy. But at the same time. But also, it was totally. It was also totally happening. Tooth and claw, come on. (laughs) There there are very much episodes where they scream just had a lot of sex in just their body language. There is also the fact that in every uh, story that uh, they write for Doctor Who, There's going to be a punchline, a major punchline, whether it takes five episodes to get to or five minutes. I mean, they're going to do something that you just go, ha ha. Even though it's it's that dry British humor that I really, really love, but it's that that moment where he does something or says something that's just so off the wall, that's so out there that you can't help but laughing. Even if it's not funny, it's just that epic level of quirk. And here we go. Here's E.T. Well, you know, you were asking us if Jack was anywhere on this playlist. There I'd say go. Jack is, is anywhere. If Jack is Jack anywhere, is in here. Captain Jack, yeah. Fun, yeah. Fun, if one of the funniest characters of the series introduced in one of the scariest episodes ever created. Mm-hmm. Yes. But see, the thing about Jack that I love also is you're talking about those punchlines that they're building to. Probably my favorite punchline that took them four seasons to build to is that <sighs> moment... Where the best reveal, where, ever. where the best reveal ever that Jack is the face of Bo, one yes. of the pivotal characters in the yeah. first series of Doctor Who, and then he goes, "Oh well, I'm, that's my mom." I was you know, known as the, the face, face of, of Bo, and, and they don't say anything. Martha and the Doctor just have slack jaw, open face, and just like what? Don't they laugh? Don't they, they start laughing? I think they start I think laughing, they start they start laughing but they, they looked laughing, yeah. they looked as shocked as the higher audiences yeah. in that moment yeah. and it's beautiful because it was leading up to that and you you always wonder the whole time well, what's Jack's connection like you know he knows the doctor you know the episode he came in but there's there's something else what's his connection and that was mm. it and it was just a punch to the chest with how powerful that that thing they've been building for so long and I get a sense of that from this song is that it's this is that that bre- that brevity that release from where we've gotten they, to the well, the release that they much needed. You yes. need, you need <laughs> fish sticks and cream, all right? You, yeah. can't just, you can't just keep going on and on and on and on. With fish fingers and fish We're fingers. talking about an intermission in the span of just of, of just 15 tracks. Of course, you need some, probably several intermissions in the span of, of seven. Well, we get a little lighthearted here That's, in the middle of it, yeah. a little bit. Gotcha. And, <laughs> and Doctor Who also has a habit of getting lighthearted in the middle of stuff as well, because you don't 
too much Waters of Mars will make everybody You need crazy. 11 monsters every yeah. once in a while. Yeah, I, and I will defend that episode if anybody wants to. Love and monsters? Yeah. Well, no, you need a Christmas episode. Or, you know, oh, the Christmas, oh, the so Christmas, Christmas ones can be so oh. sad. No, oh, love and no, monsters Christmas... is like such a caper kind of... It's a caper. remember, the Christmas episodes in general were always designed to be uh, a great story with a great happy lesson at the end not the they were whimsical they were whimsical exactly. earlier on but the most recent yeah, ones I mean, have they not clearly been and also don't consult with like the other british christmas specials like downton abbey where let's not go down let's that not road. go down that road but, but the no, british I would like, like to go down the that british road like <laughs> pain on christmas apparently they do. They love, yeah apparently they love yeah, pain these, these they, they always had like some sort of especially we're talking about you know the, like, the first four seasons. Talking about the first four seasons, the Christmas episodes were always uplifting. By the Voyage end. of the Damned was uplifting a little bit. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone <laughs> died. <laughs> okay, Sorry, we're just theory is wrong. <laughs> not oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah. Kylie Minogue dies. Kylie Minogue dies, but then she gets a little ghost kiss from the doctor. So lucky her. <laughs> lucky her. I guess. Let's uh, let's jump on to the next track, <laughs> "Edge of Desire" by John Mayer. Um, for as much as I know of John Mayer, I'd actually not heard the song before. Um, and speaking of Dark Desire, which John always likes to bring up anywhere he can find it, mm-hmm. this song <laughs> is kind of dripping with it. You know, <laughs> what we're talking about, and I use nice that terminology nice on purpose. Nice choice of words. Um, you know, it, this is very... Of all the songs that we've heard at this point, this is definitely, with E.T., one of the more sensual songs. Clearly very much pointing out that there's no way the Rose and the Doctor traveled for as long and were so head over heels for each other as they were and didn't do anything. You know, it, it's... It, the doc, Doctor Who did start out as a kid's show or in theory a kid's show and there's a lot of that and it's they still try and keep it very PG, but... You know, there's some R-rated stuff going on not on the show. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what fan f- fiction is for. Right. Yeah, but and let's not forget that Russell T. Davies also created Queer as Folk, and yes, he. I mean, I my head canon is that he knew when he was throwing in these little things. It's like. It's like the code, right? It's yeah. like well, the you know when they go into the tunnel on the train, everyone knows what that means. Like yeah. that's kind of how I feel. Well, when he has like when... two when he has two buttons undone on his car. Yeah, well, they were yeah. and, yeah, and, and the he code. very much said in so many interviews that they were unequivocally in love with each other. Yeah. So it wasn't us. It wasn't a Chris Carter denying it for <laughs> nine seasons before right. admitting that Mulder and Scully were in love. Trump. It was. <laughs> You know, saying from the beginning, it's obvious that these people. Right. Are well, that's also reflected in the doctor's in later relationships. The fact that he's so. With Martha, he's so oblivious and doesn't notice. And then with Donna, he just wants a friend. Mm-hmm. Is a reflection on the fact that he was so madly in love. With and Gre- well, yeah. I mean, and that's our thing with series three. And I mean, that could be a whole other podcast that uh, he's grieving that whole season. And yeah. that's why the Martha thing doesn't work and it's why that character was misserved yeah. by having her be unrequitedly in love with the doctor and yeah, yeah it's something that's interesting to touch on but it made those of us who were still grieving rose tyler as well <laughs> have a hard time with series three right. as far as that relationship between the doctor and the companion yeah, I mean, it's fairly obvious, at least with this particular... In context of the playlist, This you just went... You took a balls to the wall a desire track, and it, it does kind of work, at least I feel that, within the uh, the little pattern in the guitar that was just doing those little intervals, and it repeats and repeats throughout the entire track, which is just this very light electric guitar thing, but it's it, it, it actually kind of makes you forget a little bit that it's a four-chord progression because of the fact that you it's not just hammering down these chords. You're a little bit more involved. So again, yeah. I think we're... We're back into the uh, slightly, slightly introspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it. I don't know. I, this song was a, coming after the the previous. I think I think anything could have probably thrown me back into <laughs> into reality here, but, or at least the reality of the um, of this particular epic. But you know, I don't know. I think it worked for me. And then we get something that... So, wait, before we get to that, oh. anyone who has been taking bets at this point, if you had a whole new world for track 11, you win. Because <laughs> you knew it would be on this playlist somewhere. And this song is, obviously, if we have to explain to you anything about a whole new world, you shouldn't be listening to a music podcast. Because 
Unless you're... No, we've actually explained a whole new world on this podcast before. We've talked have about you? Disney. Have we? We've oh, we talked about, about Disney. No, but you, and we you mentioned Disney from time to time. And, uh, we mentioned and, uh, Disney, but have we talked about a whole new world? No, well, probably not a whole new world. We All shouldn't right. have to. All yeah, right. we really well, shouldn't have to. Let's just talk about how much we love it. All right, well, it's so, such a great song, you guys. It the, really word, the word for just including this at all, I think would be called paying the audience, right? Yeah. Just lip service. Pure lip service. Well, in any opportunity I have to listen to A Whole New World again. I mean, I would never turn it down. And you guys saw me when we were listening to this. I was singing along and flying like Princess Jasmine sitting here on the couch. Like, it's... Does that phase ever lose power with any girl? No. Amazing. I mean, most Disney songs, I mean, for me, I mean, I... What does it have to do with girls? I was singing along to every word, too. There you go. Stand corrected there. Uh, (laughs) Okay, well, here's a question. I don't know who wrote this. Does anybody it's know? It's uh, Alan, Alan Menken, Menken and Tim Rice. Yep. Gotcha. I wonder if they know the monstrosity that they created. I think they know. Oh, no, they totally yeah. know. Okay. They totally forget know. Forget about, no, forget about A Whole New World. Take any song from Aladdin. Any song from Aladdin. Oh, granted, but the, that's the thing, though. Not every song from Aladdin. Like, this is pretty... Yeah, epic. Pretty broad. But I, I, I can't... It's not my favorite song in Aladdin. I don't have a favorite song from Aladdin. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's partially because I love Robin Williams, but I love everything that's sung in that uh, cartoon. I agree, but, but at the same time, point. there's no comparison between yeah. any other song. What's yeah. funny about this, though, too, is that we had had the playlist for a really long time before <laughs> we were like, oh my god, we didn't add a whole new world. Like so It was like a hitting your head against the wall moment of like, what have, what, we, been what have we been existing for? What have you been doing? <laughs> like, why have we made this? We why was put this? a whole new world You on know, here. and again, like there's great fan videos to a whole new world because it's not just a song for the for Rose and the Doctor. It's a song for the companion and the Doctor. I mean, we were talking this about that right. even earlier in this the, the, discussion. That, that's more the idea that, oh, take me with you, show me the world, show me all and this stuff. And I can show stuff. you all these things. And, yeah. And exactly. which is I'll what give it leeway on that, on that, on that, those grounds. Because, of course, it is, it is the most cliche love song you could possibly imagine. At the same time, awesome. yes, it is related. It is related for that exact yeah, reason. It's really, show me a whole new world. Uh, that place. Do, that like, doesn't fit with a lot of love stories. I, I think mean, that, um, too, we, it's, it's not, not every... Not everybody who gets invited, well, he knows to invite the right people. Yeah. But if you just, like, walked up to 20 people on the street and were like, do you want to go live this life of danger where you'll probably die or get separated from me forever? Are you down for this? Most people would be like, no, no I'm, I'm good, stay thanks, home. I'll I'm pass. good. I have, like, oranges and you black to watch. Um, <laughs> it's like, I'll take the blue Jasmine is, ve- is a brave Jasmine would strong. Jasmine would totally go with the doctor. Jasmine would be an amazing She would human. go with the doctor in a heartbeat. But anyway, we're talking about mean, a specific set, a specific type of person who right. would be brave and ballsy and, and enough to go with him. And I think that that's that's the kind of the connection. Well, I mean, and that's too. the greatest thing about when the doctor asks Rose to go with him, and, and she's like, "Is it always this dangerous?" And he just like, "Yeah." And then she just runs into the tart. You know, like it's amazing. It's amazing. And this is followed up by Ordinary Girl, which is... Ordinary, ordinary Day. day. Uh, ordinary Day, sorry. I wrote it down wrong. Yep. Yeah. Ordinary I, Day I, I by Vanessa Carlton. Written down Ordinary Boy. <laughs> I so, got that nope. corrected. Ordinary Day. So, oh, okay. uh, Vanessa Carlton is an artist that I remember when she first came out. The thing that really made her stand out for me was her piano work. I always liked her piano work. I mean, there were a lot of cookie-cutter... F- female and male singer-songwriters mm-hmm. of that time. Mm-hmm. But the fact that she played... Just like Michelle Branch playing guitar, her pl- her piano playing really made her um, stand out. And A Thousand Miles was the other song she yeah. had, right? Mm-hmm. That song, I mean, it was huge. And this one, too, is just one of those songs where the lyrics are good. They're ver- they're kind of on the nose, but the the great piano playing, which was really that through line, that makes the song stand out. Yeah, I have one comment on that, and that's only that... I really, I, okay, I like Vanessa Carlton. I really like her piano playing style. I only felt that for this particular song, it was a little bit too bright for me. Just a smidgen. I kind of wanted a little bit more depth in that piano. No. I wanted a little bit more bass in that. No, it, no it, 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 about... it, was, it was bright to the, to the degree of like uh, cheesy electronic piano style. No, no, no. Liked what she was playing, but just didn't like the tone. That, that's yeah, pure musician's gripe, though. This it's is, not like. This yeah. is the, the naive person about to get in the blue box for the first time, all right? 
That <laughs> this is all <laughs> yeah. wonder and optimism. Gonna, it really is wonder and optimism. <laughs> it's about most to grow of the song real is fast. a dream. Yeah. I mean, yeah. most of the song she's actually having a dream until yeah. the very very. But end. she's gonna grow up real fast. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, I mean, the first time I listened to this song after becoming a Whovian, I was like, oh my god, of course this song's about the doctor. And my perspective on that song was changed. Forever. No, and even and it was written way before the reboot and all that kind of stuff but I was just like the song is about this is what the playlist <coughs> has done to us in some way right, yeah. it's like oh no of course that's about the doctor and I'm never gonna hear it the same way ever again like when I had my first film crit class in college and they were like sorry we're gonna ruin movies for you forever you're never gonna be able to watch a movie the same way again that's sort of how I feel about this playlist and I take, that's what we've I done take, as this podcast right? it it just ruins ruins we don't listen to music yeah. the same yeah. way yeah. and I take life. great I've pleasure played. in playing this song for friends who are Whovians who are also kind of fangirls like us and I have many ruined many of our friends being like hey listen to this song in the context of Doctor Who and they look at me and they're like, I hate you. I hate you right now because I will never be able to hear that song differently. And well, I don't hate you right now. Oh, good. Because I've enjoyed this. I don't hate you, but I wouldn't say it was quite a success for me. I mean, maybe, maybe that's it. Like, maybe within the song, I think actually John was pretty on point when he mentioned that, that if, at least if, about it being a dream and whatnot. Yes, the brightness of the piano does kind of make sense. But it's hard for me to connect that to Doctor Who a little bit. I feel like for me, the connection... Because after all, the, as a playlist, this is about that connection mm-hmm. to Doctor Who. You kind of have to be brought over to that universe and find the connections there. And for me, I don't know, maybe this says something about me, but the darkness just made more sound. Maybe that says something yeah, about the Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're it missing... It to make more sense. There, because yeah. there is such joy in, yeah. in some also, of those you know, initial but, episodes with the companions of... You know, you have Rose like Tyler. New Earth. You this have Rose Tyler state. jumping up and down on nose on you know on on New Earth and being like, "Oh my oh, god, this is definitely. so amazing!" Or in and the middle of like being chased by a werewolf, where they're like, "This is a werewolf! werewolf!" and they freak out and they're so. Or even excited. like Donna Noble when he takes her back to uh, Pompeii and right. she's so she's in that bazaar and she's, she's so in excited. the marketplace. Yeah, in the marketplace and she's like, "This is the." Cool and thing, like, and that's didn't she what. Say, like, did, did you take me to? Did you bring me to Epcot? <laughs> yeah, and that, th- those are the kind of things that make that song work for me within the context of the show. Fair enough, and in true. the context there, there is of that the playlist, quirky British or voice Amy also. when Amy's he's holding Amy's foot out and she's in space and her hair's everywhere and we are in space and yeah. her, you know it's that's that what that moment is for me. All right, I'll I'll, I'll take your point on that. Yes. The British Wait, party. I'm sorry. One more thing was when Jackie says something to him about all that danger, and he's like, "Oh, that's just the bits in between. Mm-hmm. Like, there's there's travel and there's fun and there's like right. shenanigans and laughter and joy that all happen in between. It's not like they're just like hopping from disaster to disaster. Those are just right. for the episode's fault. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Actually, <laughs> I, I will, I will, I will concede defeat on that one. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Ha. He doesn't do that often, so you should yes. enjoy it's your victory. It's just because we're the guests. I think I've had, yeah, he's no, no, being no, nice I've to the guests. Two. I've had two. I think. <laughs> I've had one or two as well. Um, the next track is Till Kingdom Come by Coldplay. Another artist like in the vein of what Steve was saying, I kind of expected a Coldplay song somewhere. <laughs> there are a lot of them that I feel would work. Um, Til- There's a lot on the big playlist. <laughs> Till Kingdom Come is one that I didn't expect, but that I think does work very well. And I... Coldplay is a band that I had a difficult relationship with in the beginning because <laughs> no, never. <laughs> and, see, and I get that, and I and I understand why people like them, and I love them now. But I just for some reason the song Yellow hit all the chords that I didn't want and I didn't like, did not want. All right, if we're gonna have an aside here, I will say there's only one Coldplay song that I can think of that I that I kind of disliked, and it was only because of the way people pitched it to me, and that was the song Clocks. Clocks is the How only did they song. It to you? That because of the fact that every single person had to learn that piano key. Mm-hmm. Da, 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 I was in, I, I would go from class to class, but this is back uh, when I was going from high school into college, so it was like, if I was in any music classroom, then whoever's sitting by the piano needed to play that. It's just a major chord. That's all it is. It's just a triad. Da, 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 da. Mm. It's not hard to play, but everybody got it stuck in their heads. And they started to see Coldplay for that and that alone, mm. which is just a small, tiny fraction mm. of what they are and what they can do. That was basically their, all right, let's, let's get our easy cookie-cutter pop song out there, which did kind of maybe inflate their popularity, but they had so much else to bring to the table that it seems so silly at this point to focus on that. Mm. But thankfully, that's why this is not there. This is not Clocks. This yes. is another Coldplay song. Yeah, yes. and this was uh, this. This had 
two things. It, it was a back and forth, uh, tete a tete going from the doc's point of view, coupled with a lot of like foreshadowing of the conclusion of the storyline that's being built here. The, the, the kind of harkening back to uh, room at the end of the world. It's 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 got you know it's it's there it's there it's. Coldplay, Coldplay does this in a lot of their songs. They tease tragedy with yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, it is well, tragedy. It's, it's exactly tragedy. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. Brought, not brought that well, because That's they they, they, they yeah. do it in all of their songs. My, my favorite song by them, <laughs> my favorite song by them, which may or may not be on your playlist, is uh, "Viva La Vida." I don't believe that song. But but I like no. that song because it's we'll talk, give it another listen. It's, Mine is Sparks. <laughs> It, Which it, is funny. I thought of that when I saw stars here. I think Sparks is Sparks on the is list. On, yeah. Oh, Yellow that, is on the list. That like, makes this playlist. But great. the thing about yeah. Viva La Vida that I like, regardless if it's related to Doctor Who, but it's very much the point about Coldplay that I was making, is it starts with I'm you know I used to rule the world like that. That's the first verse talks about how he used to rule the world. Tragedy already happened before the song even began, mm, and yeah. the story of the song began, and you get a lot of sense of that in in songs like. And I think that might be why I like Yellow so little is that song was just was such a base level compared to everything they've done since, and mm. I just didn't see any astonishment in that early song. So your yellow is my clocks. Yes, like, but yeah, but yeah. moving forward in their discography, there was just so many other great things that they've done, mm. and and Till Kingdom Come is no exception. And and it, it really does tease that you know something bad's coming. You know something bad's going to happen. Even if we don't mention it, it's there. Yeah. And, and you know, we've discussed those yeah. tragedies in yeah. other points in the song. There's two straight, uh, I guess they're verses. I suppose they're verses. But in, in the end, in your tears and in your blood, in your fire and in your flood, I hear you laugh, I heard you sing, I wouldn't change a single thing. Yeah. And so, I think there's this... He just to keep on putting one foot in front of the other and going on another trip. The doctor has to at some point absolve himself. Yeah, and the way that he can do that, especially with Rose, is that she, he never had to force her to do anything. She was her own person. She was making her own choices, and it was their choices together <laughs> that led them to where they ended up. And. And he does wallow, and he does blame himself for a while, and he does need Martha and um, Donna to bring him back out of that. But, you know, the, if, if anything's going to do it, that's what's going to do it. Well, yeah, the lyrics to yeah. say you'll come and set me free, to say you'll wait, you'll wait for me. Yeah, and it definitely, there's a there's a connection there. Also, I kind of like, um, I believe this was, this was the chorus of the verse, I'm not entirely sure, but this particular one. The wheels just keep on turning, the drummers begin yeah. to drum. I don't know which way I'm going, I don't know what I've become. I feel like this is a lot more character development, at least in terms of this uh, selection of playlists here. Mm. I feel like I'm well, that whole paragraph into is his game. pretty much the tail end of the Martha story. The, the master, the war of the drums, the not knowing what he's become, being turned into what his actual age should show. All of that stuff really is defined in even that bit of character development. And there's a ton of character development in that tail end of that season, because the beginning half kind of Flanders yeah, a bit. Yeah, but yeah. the tail end is so strong with Calder development and really gets you to know the Doctor and Martha much better. Mm -hmm. As well as the support characters because they all play yeah. a big role in those final episodes too. Um, um, and just before we move on from Coldplay, we do have to also say that it had to be on there as a shout out to David Tennant who loves Coldplay. Who loves, loves Coldplay. Coldplay. He loves Coldplay as nice. well and it's one of my favorite animated gifs of him, him is defending yeah. uh, fixing it. Fix yeah, and yeah, I will it. try to fix you. I've what is he? <laughs> yeah. Is he hosting Friday Night Project? Yes, I think yeah. he's hosting And everyone's, he's everyone's like, making fun of him, like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, and he's like, Coldplay is awesome. And then he just keeps pressing the button all the time. And yeah. so, and then obviously that's why Fix You is on the playlist. The playlist yes. at some point, which at I some point. Shout, yeah. out yeah. David Shout out to David Tennant. We know you're listening. We can only hope. Track 14 on the playlist is actually song I had heard before, Lover of Light, A uh, Lover of the Light, by Mumford and, Mumford and Sons. It was from their most recent record, which came out a year and a half ago or so. Which won the Grammy for Album of the Year. It did. Babel. Um, and so this song, I had fallen in love with Babel. I listened to it about three or four months ago, and I really liked it. Um, mostly because I admire the Mumford and Sons pretty much decided they're going to play a type of music. And they're going to pretty much convey more or less a, a 
fairly set um, grouping of emotions. I think but, they're smart marketers for that purpose. But, but they play this music and play it in a way they're like, look, yes, we're a lot of rise, we have some drops, we have some cliches, but this is us, this is what we do, and we accept the cliches and the stereotypes that go along with it, and we don't care. This is our music. This is how and we want to we're going to play our banjos. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> and it comes through in their music until videos the and their lyrics. Comes. Yeah, the we will play the banjos until the world ends well, around The other thing is, walk on stage <laughs> with just, our drums on our backs. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's like the good old boys, but at the same time, you know these guys are just having fun. Like, that's, yeah. they do it not because it's a good... Uh, well, I, a, they a have good, a shtick, and that's their shtick. And, and I think it's this sort of... Universalization of of folk in a way because sometimes yeah, especially when they started it was like oh yeah this is like an like an Irish outcrop mm-hmm. and I yeah. was totally seeing that and then after a while I was like you know you could kind of connect this to a little bit of Americana and it's like you know you could kind of connect it to a little bit of just uh, well, Midwestern folk in general been a boom with them with like Mumford and Sons and you have the Avery brothers and the Meniers, 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 Meniers and so it's like this whole kind of yeah growth that I think that Mumford really like I think that, yeah, I agree for they, that. they are they are the progenitors even if that. some of the other ones have been around longer, because I think the Avit brothers have been around for longer. They've been around for longer. But oh, yeah. they didn't break They've through. They've benefited from this. They've well, way the benefited Folk from Folk in general, Mumford. of course, has been around since ages past. Yeah. But yeah, pushing it really to, like, pop level, mm-hmm. I think that really is, is they're responsible for that. Mm-hmm. Because country used to be sort of in a whole separate world. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, a, or if you're a country fan, that's kind of a whole other tree of genre. Oh, and totally. And now all of a sudden, it, it's sort of pervading, you know, by... Plenty of people in the I mean, city I listen just, to Mumford. I love the instrumentation of it, and and seeing them live too. It's it's amazing. Just their musicianship is so good, mm-hmm. and how it they they work everyone into like a religious frenzy. It's not even funny how they do, and it's they're amazing. Going back with to the song, scruffiness. with Lover, their scruffiness. Going back to the song "Lover of Light," though, I do have to say that as much as Mumford and Sons tends to repeat their own cliches gladly. <laughs> Lover of Light doesn't fit into that as much. No. Lover of Light is a very very much out a little bit outside their comfort zone, but in a great way. It's this beautiful song that is a little slower, not all rise, mm-hmm. not not doesn't have the predictable um, dropouts like a lot of their other songs do to build back up. And it, it, it really does give this this flow. What I want to know is what inspired you to choose this song? I will answer this one. Do because it. we have not we, we haven't referred to this part of the story yet but uh, Ten Two. I mean let's talk about Ten Two. Let's talk about the fact that the end of the Rose and Doctor story was that uh, I won't do all of the exposition but a regeneration energy was put all into the hand that had been cut off of the tenth doctor in uh, in his first Christmas special, his debut episode, yeah. and grew into a half human, half doctor clone of him. Um, and uh, ten basically gave that clone to Rose, <laughs> and then they lived together happily, happily ever after. ever after on in the uh, parallel, in the universe. parallel universe. Um, so that's and they even kind of have, and it was cut time. out of the episode, but they even have ten gives them a seed to grow their own TARDIS. Right. TARDIS so it is freaking canon that Rose and Ten Two are saving universes and traveling through the stars in Pete's world. So it's a happy Done. ending to some degree, where she gets she gets her own Doctor. She gets it's him essentially, and he says, and he ages with and her, and he ages with her, and he has one life and. Um, one heart you know, and, and, and yeah but the actual doctor has to watch this happen and turn around and leave them on the beach and knowing very very literally that there is a version of himself that's living a life that he thinks he maybe might have wanted to yeah, live at some point yeah um and I that's love just stories that go down so that route. Tragic. That, that's an aspect of just science fiction in general that I'm fascinated by. The mm-hmm. idea that there can be another you living a life that you either wanted to live or didn't want to live. Yeah. It's just the idea of splitting yourself in two is fascinating. Well, yeah, and also right. this idea that, you know, the doc, it's the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate selflessness. I gave you me, but I still can't have you. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. terrible. Yeah. And, it's and terrible. his face. It's heartbreaking. David Tennant's fall. face is just brilliant in it because he is happy but on the other end he's like god this really sucks right yeah. well it's like even that brief brief moment 
in um, the 50th anniversary special where... Um, oh, what's the actor's name who played the wartime doctor? Uh, John, who's, John, who's John, John Hurt, who stole my heart in that sh- episode. Uh, he was amazing. Yeah. Um, when he goes, oh, well, that's what that bad wolf girl's been saying. And Tennant literally goes, what bad wolf girl? And they move on. Like, like, he also, really can't think of anything. Well, and also in that moment, I mean, it could have been just a styling thing or whatever, but we <laughs> point this out on our blog that his hair is very flat all yes. through that episode. Disappointingly yeah. flat. And disappointingly flat because that's one of the best things about the 10th Doctor is his epically spiky yeah. hair. And in that moment, in the camera shot, I don't know if he had ruffled his hair or something, but in that shot, and th- that shot alone, if you yeah. watch the 50th again, yeah. he has 10th Doctor hair. Yeah, yeah. And it's like a moment where it's like his hair He's even, almost himself his again. Hair even knows. His hair knows. His, his hair knows. Her. Some version of Rose <laughs> is it's around. Close. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, so it's sorry. Like, no, that's okay. <laughs> I know I tried. I was not stable and pl- flawed by pride. So love the one you hold, and I'll be your goal. To having to hold a lover of the lights, it's like. Well, see, that's fascinating because that is so on point. It's actually unbelievably we're able to stumble across this, this song. Yeah. Did, I mean, yeah. did you just already know this song and you I mean, thought back knew, to the lyric we, and that was it? We were listening to. I think we were just listening to Mumford one day, and I was like. And we kind of were both just like, oh, yeah, this should go on the playlist. Yeah. And it's just like, that's how it kind of works some of the times. Is we're just listening to things. We're like, oh. We're you saying, know, does this work? And well, because now, no, I don't really now think it's it like our brains are trained to listen to music Basically. that way. And, you know. Well, that happens. I mean, I listen to music way more critically now. Even yeah. though I always did subconsciously, now I consciously listen that's to music. That's a whole other crit- level of, of putting an impression on something. We're trained yeah. to listen critically, and now they're trained to listen to music to search for Doctor Who references. Yes, and yeah, or, it's sad. Uh, it's sad, but parodies. true. But and we know awesome. that, you know, there are certain artists who, if they have a release that, that <coughs> does come out, we're like, oh yeah, I'll listen to We're like, oh, the script album came out. We're right, gonna like, listen to this. We know we're gonna probably right. find something. Um, right. Let's jump on to the next track. Track 15, Cosmic Love on by point. Florence <laughs> and the Machine, which is actually my favorite song on the playlist. I liked okay. a lot of them, but this is my favorite. I know Florence and the Machine, I've heard them before, but this song, somehow I missed it. But mm. this is actually a song that I added to a personal playlist of mine after hearing it. I'm building yes. my fifth playlist for my beautiful girlfriend, Sarah, who I love. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. And so um, this is one of those songs that I plucked for that playlist because it's just, it's such a beautiful song. One more song. time, this is Cosmic Love by Florence, by Florence and the Machine. Machine. That's right. Yeah, this was, um, this was pretty phenomenal, actually. I, I felt the same connection here uh, as I did back with those that trio of dark songs here. And it had to do... Uh, with the fact that it took a little interesting spin on it, and that was the inclusion of the harp, mm. which is just one of those instruments I, I, I'm a sucker for, an absolute sucker for. If you if you have the balls to just bring a harp into the song, <laughs> it's, it's uh, or you have the balls to play a harp, because it's a very difficult instrument to play, even if it is just these little flourishes here and there, which is, which is straightforward, but it, it, it complements this with this mm. little sweet touch upon sort of that dark framework that just had me draw it in immediately. I... I, I, I Granted, the lyrics here are beautiful. At the same time, I wouldn't have even cared what they were saying necessarily mm. because I was so. But cool. the lyrics are so amazing because it basically is Bad Wolf Rose, you know. Not but, just Bad Wolf or Rose. This is the the combination. This of the is the culmination together. of the parting of the ways with yeah. with the Ninth Doctor for, yeah. you know, her saving absorbing him and absorbing the... the time vortex and I want you safe, my Doctor, and yeah, you know, the stars, the moon, they've all gone out. And it's yeah. no dawn, no day. I'm in this twilight in the shadow of your heart. That's that's a fascinating line right there. I'm yeah. in the twilight again. That being trapped sort of between one thing and another. Mm-hmm. I just you know that obviously if you know Doctor Who that sums up his entire existence. But just the concept itself of being trapped between two things: twilight hovering on the horizon, not quite one, not quite the other, polar extremes. Well, also this idea that he always, he's always ultimately saving everyone, and then she saves him. But he still save has her. to save her right. because this will kill her and he mm. pulls in the vortex. It's still the saddest regeneration for me. It's the only one that's made oh, me cry. A... Um, also that's partially well, because... And he saves Echo her said, by kissing her too. Right. You know, and saying probably the cheesiest written line it's in the so history fun. of it Dr. Been Rose. Waiting the whole He's been waiting the whole time. Because I don't know if you remember I, Steve, I don't know if you remember Steve but it, it, it right after <laughs> Rose is being torn apart by the, the, the vortex... Do- he all he says before kissing her is goes. It looks like you need a doctor. Yes. Yes. 
Gotcha. I, oh, bought, I do remember that. I, yeah, I do remember that now. I yeah. bought uh, there was a print of that moment at yeah. Gallifrey One uh, uh, in the art show uh, oh, yeah. that I saw it, and it's called "I Want You Safe, My Doctor," and I was like, "Bought, done." <laughs> well, it is <laughs> framed about... now on my wall, just a nice. depiction of Nine about to kiss Rose, and she's got the time vortex streaming out of her, and it's just. It's I'll what a way to end your first season. <laughs> That's how I love how many layers that line can actually work. As a twilight, it could stand. I mean, of course, I mean, regeneration. It's standing between on the brink of life and death, or life and another life, yeah. or the responsibility. Because again, you can have, obviously this is down to interpretation. When you receive this playlist and you're thinking about the doc- Doctor Who, you can. I, I actually first went to the idea that this is sort of his responsibility, sort of between. Uh, but the res- the amount of power that he yeah. has, that mm-hmm. basically the capacity for good and for evil, and he's always hovering right in between. <laughs> Tries to do good, but there's always that debate. That there's always a deliberation who to save and all that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, and now the the with the fiftieth now being part of the canon since you mentioned it, and the moment taking the form of Rose. Yeah. That that was that was out of everything. I, yeah. Out of everything, I, out of, I I I chose this from your past or your future. I always get those two confused or something like that. Yeah. Just um, and uh, and that's what does that mean? Does that mean that does that mean that he even though he forgot it that there was something latent where he recognized her or he was drawn to her in that store that day at the beginning of season one? I mean, right. it's just like the it idea kind that, of makes it cyclical, their right? The idea that that moment led him to her right. or that she led him, him to, to that, that yeah, moment, yeah, right? And it's just it's. It's beautiful. It's very sick. It's the represent her being the form of Rose is the, <coughs> the physical representation of Wibbly Wobbly Tommy One. Yeah, and yeah. I, and we were so nervous when they announced that, that she was Billy was going to be a part of it because she shouldn't be. Well, and but. Stephen Moffat is known to hate her, her, a whiny yeah. girlfriend, a clingy girlfriend, and she should just get over it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we were a little worried that she would be diminished in the story well, well, before, and it was the complete opposite before we get to the final track the one thing I want to say on the case of the 50th is while it's still gaping holes from people that should have been in it yes it was very well done and better than I expected agreed yes especially then when you had the Christmas episode yes. this year which was, was horrendous and yes. you'll notice that there's not a post about it on Head Over Feels is because I couldn't make myself write it I hated it that much but um, and it's fun to write about things. I know it's though. fun, but I was just like, oh, I can't. Some of our, I know, but you don't want to hate Doctor. I don't want to hate part. Doctor Who. Some so. of our best early episodes is when we were crapping on a terrible album. Well, and then it also took you know me so long to do it. Where I was like, the moment's passed. I yeah. can't write about oh, this right. now. She's the moment gone. passed. I mean, maybe the moment kept me from trashing maybe. Doctor Who on our blog. Who were such known Doctor, Doctor Who, Who lovers. Yeah. You know. Um, why don't we jump into the final track? Speaking of cyclical nature and and all of that, we have dust nice to dust. Transition. Yeah. I have a few of those once in a while. Some of them are really poor though, too. So you know, <laughs> it's a fifty fifty. More like seventy thirty. You don't have any, so at least I have some. <laughs> and we'll move on to the civil wars. I'm gonna stab. Later, off the air. I don't want to bleed on the microphone. So this is dust to dust by the civil wars, which. Be it an accident in order or not is a great conclusionary track to this playlist. I know, that was totally accident and wonderful. And see, that's a theory I have about playlist making, (laughs) is that I feel like when you're making a playlist, when you're making a playlist for something that you care about greatly, whether it's a person, a fandom, (laughs) whatever it is, a movie, whether you're consciously thinking of the order or not, subconsciously you're arranging, you're planning, and you're putting things together. And whether you were planning this order or not, it worked out because you know the content so well, you know the song so well, and so you made this order, by accident or not, somewhere in the subconscious, you were, it was coming together. Yeah. And that's very apparent of playlist making and back in the day mixtape making and so on and so forth. It says something about the greater playlist at large, of course, yes. if, if this small selection was mm-hmm. able to hit home in, in its, and, and be a, a, an individual arc itself. So... This was also a little bit of a drastically different tone than we had gotten from any, everything else. You saw a direct connection to the, to the beginning, correct, Matt? Yes. All right. I actually thought this was a little bit, um, a little bit on the side, but I was okay with that. I was okay that it ended a little bit differently than it began, um, at least in my years. This was again a little bit back to that sort of steadiness, focusing on 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 the more, I think, narrow-eyed view of a particular 
particular aesthetic. Because if you take back, I mean, this is the first one that is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more acoustic. You have it instead of instead of a drum, instead of a drum set, it's just a drum machine, just doing yeah. a slight little tap. So it sounds almost electronic, or as if it's uh, being thinned out so much to the point that you imagine yourself like on an operating table or something yeah. like that, like that level of depth, and. Um, just the slight, delicate alternating guitar that went alongside that. It really, really becomes about their voices in that one, to me. Yeah. But, Which um, stand out, you know, completely. And I think that's in the design of the song. Yeah. Is you're supposed to focus on the voices and how they're And singing, their harmony together. <laughs> which and is gorgeous. It's an instrument in itself. Sorry. Oh, I'll that's just... okay. That's all right. I have, I have, there's one more really, really important thing that I thought... This is why this seems so different to me. It's the only track which actually had a single instrument that spanned the course of the track. And I don't mean that in the way like, oh, that instrument is still there doing its same old thing. Instead, it seemed to tie together the measures. And it was that guitar, which was just sort of on an open note that would string out for like beat after beat after beat. And it just maintains itself. It's like an ambient tone, but it's not there throughout. It comes, and then it goes. Then it comes back. It's a different note, and then it goes. And it was just back and forth. I just love that. It's a, it, it, I like anything that tends to uh, be greater than the measures themselves. This also speaks to uh, a sadness, but a sadness that has a finality that has also an acceptance and an understanding to it. Uh, that does put a period <laughs> on the actual... Uh, uh, idea that 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 was that's being created in the song, it ends and it's a finality in the ending, that really does mean it, it's an end. It's a song that this can't go anywhere else on any album. I couldn't see this being on its original album anywhere but as a finale piece. And I think it's it in the middle. Be, of that's this album. no, that's that's wrong. They <laughs> I wrong. think I'm not. I mean, I'd have to look <laughs> up the album on Spotify right that. now. No, they're wrong about that. This has I'm, to be I'm gonna an look. ending piece. Because it's just so, it it's it, there's so much. Unless they really go upbeat and try to save the tragedy that is created the in this Wars, song. No, they're. I mean, the Civil Wars. If you I know don't anything know about them as artists, they broke up after this. I mean, maybe even before this album, but they had already started recording this album, and like they don't speak to each other anymore. They won't oh, tour anymore. Intense. It's very intense. There's lots of rumors about what happened. They're both married to other people. Married to other people, but there's rumors. And, you know, they're very fraught with in a, their artistry. And it comes, it comes through. It comes through in the War. recording. Interesting. But well, another reason I like this is because it seemed to... It seemed to... It was an appropriate <laughs> summary, at least for the course of this. And again, we're facing a track that was not necessarily intended to be an ending for this selection or the greater playlist, the playlist at large. But it it was kind of a pretty good summary because it had these little dark twists just in the chords here and there. You would have a dark twist that immediately pulls itself back, it, and then you go back to, back toward the more it's positive track four lines. on the album. It's not even near the <laughs> end. Not, that's, that's, Sorry, I just had to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it, it did seem very summarizing in that way, because you get both. It, the thing is, previously, there's a lot of tracks here which are at least, they're just exploring one or the other. You're exploring, like, one of the dark sides of the relationship, or you're exploring the more quirky, fun, lighthearted aspects. But this one seems to sort of explore both. And I'm just talking aesthetically at that point, because that's, that's uh, it's what the music gave me. It's what the individual chord twists turn. Occasionally, it'll go dark in one moment, it pulls right back after that. Mm -hmm. well, also, Sometimes I interpret it as not being developmental, but at least because this is a conclusion, it, it fits really work. It, it fits well. Right, and also the idea just in the title of Dust to Dust, this fact that the Doctor will seemingly now, especially since his regeneration's got the reset button, but we're not getting into that, um, <laughs> he'll live forever or close, damn close to it. <clears throat> no one else he experiences well. Not his companions, not his allies, not his enemies. Except maybe the master, maybe, but who knows? But the idea that the doctor will never have that cycle of dust to dust. He will not. He his his time may never end, but mm -hmm. everything he knows eventually does, mm -hmm. and that's so final and gloomy and depressing. It's kind of almost. It's, it's why he mourns every separation like yeah. it's a death, even if it's not, because he mm -hmm. he knows that he will still have to go on. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that this this is a, a very strong representation of the canal I do a playlist. And I think in in construction of this playlist, whether it was intentional or not for a track order, it functions very well as a playlist 
it may not function for every fan of Doctor Who, depending on their music taste. Yeah. But as far as if you just read the lyrics straight going through this playlist, you'd be able to pick out the connections in each song. You would definitely be able to make that linkage. Um, and I feel personally with a playlist, sometimes music skill, music quality takes a back seat to emotionality and, and theme. Because if you're making a playlist yourself, it's of songs you like, regardless of whether they're good, great, bad, whatever. You like them and you connect with them. And that's what makes a strong playlist is song after song that you connect with if you're making it for yourself. Song after song that someone else would connect with if you're making it for them. And this playlist does that, hands down. Yeah, it's a very fun time. And that's the big thing about playlists. It's it's hard to really, like... You get people who don't like classic rock. Well, how are you going to throw in some Beatles if you think that fits the kind of theme you're working with here? You got people who don't like, you know, post-rock. So how are you going to fit this, that, and the other thing in there? It's hard to, to communicate. It put any case myself. Um... <laughs> what? <laughs> but it, everybody's got specific themes. Playlists are it, it, at once really easy to do, but also really freaking hard to do. Because, well, the simplest one, the tropey ones are like the breakup pay- playlist or the getting yourself ready kind of, you know, psych up playlist. Your get psyched or, mix. To, yeah. quote, yeah. psyched to quote, it's all rise, to it's, quote Barney Well, Stinson. it should be all rising because how would you go down? <laughs> yeah, it's all rise. <laughs> you, you have to psych It should all out. be shot through the so heart. And, and you're to blame. By Bon Jovi. Yeah. But like, if you yeah it's look, funny because I just had this joke with my friend that it, whenever you want to get psyched for something or you want to do something really bold, like, no, you're going to do everything bold ever. No, I'm going to get that job. No, I'm going to ask that girl. I'm going to do everything. Listen to Sugar, because it's the angriest, <laughs> scariest music you will ever hear. So now that's the trope for anything else. If you want to do something bold, Meshuga. Balls to the wall, Meshuga. Noted. Mashuga Duly balls. noted. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were originally going to try and rate the playlist, but Steve made a good point that it, it's a playlist. You you can't really rate a playlist on the same ways we would rate an album. Yeah, this is not a this is not a rating per se. I yeah, think we should all I just think... give our our own summation on how, on how we on how it affected us personally. I mean, I connected with every song except one, and but <coughs> felt they were all connected to Doctor Who and Rose's connection, or even Doctor Who in general. So that came through, and I really did connect with the whole thing, and it'll stay on my Spotify list. Yay! <laughs> Success. I. To, to tackle something as specific and niche as Doctor Who is kind of hard. Because, well, where do you start? I mean, he's had every storyline and every genre. He makes up his own genre, so they can have a new, you know, genre to go into. That's what they do with the character, so it's kind of hard to do it. The, the thing about a playlist is if you're going to say it's a... X, Y, Z. If it's a breakup playlist, well, it's got to actually say to that. It's, if it's a, you know, if you want to do the Mickey Mouse Club, if you want to do a Disney playlist, well, you don't just have to take Disney songs, but you got to make it feel that wholesome childhood wonder. This feels like, yeah, a tragic love story that takes place in space and time. So this was, yeah, really right on the money for me. Success. <laughs> Yay. So this is something I could never do, personally. Because I'm somewhat on the perimeter here, being Doctor Who is not as fresh in my head as, as it is for most of you. At the same time, thoroughly enjoyed the show, thoroughly enjoyed the relationship and the character development there. Um, but also for another reason, I'm not an avid playlist maker. It's something, it's just the way I think personally. I tend to think of things as being very much of what the, oh, that particular thing that was written for this film. It was meant to fit the film and, and nothing else. Or an album, no, it should stand on its own. Don't, don't remix it and constantly like flush things around. But that doesn't mean it can't work. It's just that's how I think about it. So listening through this, one after the other, you know, in the beginning, I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm a little bit like, well, that's interpretive. Anybody could, could you know, think of that. Or that, that could have been anything, for instance. But then once I get, like, five, six tracks in, it's just like, okay, that's on point. All right, that's on point. So it's like one after the other. I think there is definitely a talent there for perceiving, uh, at least just from lyrics and, you know, even on, on the feel of a song generally, and applying it to a particular storyline. So I definitely admire the project. As I said, it's <laughs> something I could never do. So I, I, I enjoyed this on the playlist level. 
not every single song is something that I would, oh, I need to go into search that oh, yeah, artist's no. discography. No, no. no. no well, that, there's saying, not even songs not, on our massive playlist that yeah. I would own. But that's <laughs> not the point, and that's the perfect, that's, that is the brilliance of this playlist, is that you shouldn't be thinking about that at all. Technically, you shouldn't even be thinking about the artist. You should just be thinking about the words, the lyrics, scenes, the, the feel, yeah. mm-hmm. and scenes. Yeah, exactly. We both binge-watched the reboot. I mean, that's how we... That's, that's how, how we I got into it also. Consumed yeah. it up until it was like season seven. Yeah, first... Asylum of the Daleks was the first one that we watched live. Oh, wow. That's even Ever. further right. than yeah. me. Like, I binge-watched yeah. up to Donna and then watched no, it live. That's... And so there's this, there's this kind of energy that builds up when you binge-watch something like that, especially something as... Emotional. Wrenching and, and, yeah. and emotional as Doctor Who, and it's like, where does this... It's like regeneration energy. Like, where does it all go? Uh, and I know, it. right? And some people are amazing artists, and some people can do fantastic fan videos, and some people are fanfic writers, and uh, we are none of those things. Yep. And so it just seemed like this was a project that we could channel all of that extra like vibration. It's, it's a way to, ampl- channel it's a way to amplify, feelings. I think, the things that you already like. Yeah. Because, let's face it, we're, we're kind of, we're all a little bit selfish. We all want that, the one thing, to be everything mm. at the moment that we're into it. Because the moment is really, really important. Never, never betray yes. the moment. So, of course, you want to do everything you possibly do to pay homage to that one particular thing. So it's great that this exists because there is bound to be the bound to be people out there who feel the exact same oh, way as you. Oh, we have like 40 and I remember, subscribers. <laughs> I, 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 I watched, uh, I, I think I read one of your posts, which went something like, whenever I be, see if you recognize this just based in the beginning, whenever I need to be reminded about how flawless my, uh, the our Doctor Ten playlist is. Ah, I think I wrote that. <laughs> it, sounds like you. it does sound like me. Yeah. Then I just go back and I search and see how other people have clearly connected oh, yeah. things with the exact same song. That's the one where I did where I linked it. all the fa- I linked fan videos that had been made to all songs that were on our playlist. Right. And you know, because every once in a while on YouTube, I will search playlist songs and be like, oh, is there a fan video to this? And usually I find them. Some of the more obscure songs or newer songs, obviously I don't. But like, I'm like, yes. I mean, even even to like a Christmas song that I put on the playlist, because there's the Sarah McLachlan winter song that this is how I see you in the snow on Christmas morning. And we're like, uh, last scene of Christmas invasion, and yeah. sure enough, I like kind of search that and Doctor Who, and there's a fan video to that song. That's the power of the internet, also, because exactly. then you also get to share all these things with other people that you might not otherwise ever meet in real life. Who knows? Yeah. No, there's always going to be a fan site for something or a um, an exploration really into the depths, the deepest trenches why, of one particular area of one particular art. It's why it's amazing being a fan now, and like we talk about it all the time of when we were fans of shows like the x-files and alias and things like that before the advent of tumblr and Mm -hmm. twitter to where you could even if you didn't know a friend that watched a show you can go on the internet and you can just search that hashtag now and you find people that will talk about the show with you before if you couldn't find anybody to talk about the show with you you just Talk to yourself, well, the, or, or make somebody <laughs> or else make, watch. Make them, somebody which is, else watch, it. which is essentially what I've been doing to Matt. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's Chuck, like four Supernatural, five. Psych. Uh, I just I rewatch things more. that I'm into that I know I'll never meet anyone else. Who's I started Doctor Who. I've never did. met you anyone else watching who, because of me. Really liked, uh, <laughs> that Sherlock was the only Fox. one probably that I got on you. Sherlock. Oh, Sherlock. No, no, Sherlock. I I was Mary. Sherlock was Mary. I saw it before it came out in America, so I guarantee <laughs> I got it. I got you into it. I guarantee. I didn't watch it till this year, so maybe. Yeah. Okay, then it was me. Anyway, All right, um, so some quick direction. We're talking about playlists in general, right? Right. No, we're talking no. about everything. We're talking about the internet mostly. <laughs> and mostly, let's talk about. I, know, the I actually now. have some and questions no, no. on playlists because okay. I would like to spin this this way, considering that is the theme of the day here. So, I think. I would like to actually get a little overview as to all the different possibilities where you could actually apply a playlist and what's perhaps the most t- important type of playlist There's, to you. That would be too long to list. The idea of doing that... Oh, no, we could go through... Well, the idea, no, no. Okay, so the idea of saying what are all the top things you can make a playlist to, you can make a playlist to anything. No, what's your most important type of playlist? 
Oh. Mine personally. I have yeah. one. I'm I have just one. looking for one answer. Here. Okay, oh. no, I got one. I got one. I got one. I was thinking about it when we were listening okay, to it. Okay, so John, go ahead. Start this was on. the playlist I created when I broke up with my uh, oh, this never college well. girlfriend. No, I. <laughs> by the time I was done with her, like, I hated her. And it was the best playlist ever. Because <laughs> it was all rise. It was it all rise! It was all rise. <laughs> I still remember. I could probably name ten of the fifteen songs that was on that was on this short little playlist I made. I remember singing on my way home from breaking up with her at her house over in freaking Bumble F, New Jersey. Oh, it was it's so always great. Bumble F, New Jersey. No, this one had there was nothing. No, about not it. not with you. Like this everyone one, I've ever met, it's always like that that girl from Bumble F, New Jersey. There was no yeah. highways don't in go, Jersey. There was no highways. Don't. It was ridiculous. I never did. <laughs> um, Interesting. It's funny that this question you pose, and yes, I'm going to make it overly complicated, but you're talking to someone who, since I had articulation and could carry myself, I've made mixes. I've made mixtapes, I've made mix CDs, now I make, I made MP3 playlists on my iPod, and now I make Spotify playlists. So asking me to pick a playlist that I prefer to make is almost impossible. So what I'm going to do instead is tell you the playlist that I make now currently, I switch between two things. The one one playlist I make, which I alluded to before, is I've made several playlists of love songs for my girlfriend Sarah, who I love. The other thing is, and I actually found, I don't, like John, I struggle to sometimes express with words myself, how I am, how I feel. I'm doing that right now. But uh, with focus from music or inspiration from music, I can do it better. And I've made several playlists that I've sent to Sarah and to a few other friends that describe me. There are songs that either describe me or the ones that I sent to Sarah describe me and how I feel about her or describe me and how I felt before I knew her or just things that represent my likes, dislikes, like I included on some of those playlists the Ninja Turtles theme, (laughs) the Doctor Who theme, Sherlock, you know. Stuff like that. So those are the two big kinds of playlists I make right now. Um, but I made things like angsty teen playlists. Mm. I made breakup playlists. Like I need it's, to shave and I don't want to playlist. Probably somewhere in high school, yeah. Um, and that's why playlist making to me, I feel, is more than just this thing. It I, There is an actual <laughs> art to it. And I'm hoping at some point to actually start my article series on it for the website. But there's just a lot that goes into it because, as you know, I'm an emotional person. There's a lot of emotional investment in making most playlists. Not all, but most. And so that's why I have such a varied catalog of what I make. I've never made a playlist about myself and my inner life, which, I mean, just you saying that, like, sounds terrifying to me. Like, that gives me, that, like, makes my chest feel tight just thinking about that. Which may be why I have created a playlist uh, (laughs) about fictional characters that is two days long, because I'm, like... Escape is look in there. Escape the word yeah, escape look in there. I mean, I'm like, it's like emotions once removed. Yeah, I'm like you, Matt, in that I grew up making playlists and making mixed CDs, and it's a it's a lost art now. I feel like because we were talking about on the way over here with the tape, you only had so much time, hmm. and now with a Spotify playlist, you, you can, can have, have one that's hour 49 playlist. hours, and there's we can have it be, you know, a week long if we want to someday. Someday, someday it, will be. it will be. So the art of and, brevity might be a little lost. I mean, yeah, the art of brevity or the art of really being Curation. selective, which is why yeah. this was fun of going through our 700 and something songs, and we were like, we have to pick out an hour's worth of music. And, you know, that is a, it's a lost art, but, you know, I have some playlists. I mean, I have one that I just call my melancholy mix, (laughs) and, like, really, I shouldn't listen to it for more than an hour, because I end up just being like, I'm gonna jump out the window. So you slap on a dosage label. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's like, and what, some days I have listened to it all day at work, and by the end of the day, I'm like, I just... I want to go eat some ice cream. <laughs> can't and can't operate like, heavy machinery. You know, can't operate. It's just like, oh, that was a bad idea. But, you know, and I also have my Get Psyched mixes and my workout mixes. I have, sure. an, I have an ultimate uh, boy band playlist. Of yeah, course. Uh, cool. You know, that's all Backstreet Boys. Well, it's actually, it's my ultimate, like, teen pop one yeah. that it's, you know, all the 90s teen pop that was glorious right. and still remains glorious and... 
I love it. And I see the fake, the look on your face and you're judging me. I'm not saying anything. You know, you can't judge my music because I love it. You can yeah. judge it, but... We do judge it. You do judge it. It's your job, but also you can't judge why I love it. No, no. no that's, that's one thing true. we've always done. And that's what playlists are it. about, you don't, know. Don't it's tread like, on me, man. Don't tread on me. It's what, okay. playlist, it's what a good playlist is about. So, something I want to get to um, before we wrap up today is I want to talk a little bit about Head Over Feels. Since we're talking about the internet and we're having you guys on because you are the, as far as I'm aware, creators of Head yes. Over Feels. Yes. So... I, I want to know because I actually, being your friend, don't know this. How did Head Over Feels come wait, to be? Wait, first and foremost, tell the audience what Head Over Feels actually is. <laughs> Head Over Feels, yeah, I want, Head over I feels want to hear this one. is a website. Uh, we fangirl. We're fangirls. We love, when we love things, we love them super hard. And this is but our way. Without, but not without critical thought. having a critical thought, too. We're not afraid to, unless it's an extreme hate like I had with that <laughs> new episode, we're not afraid to, like, critique and look and examine why we love things and why people love things and what are the things that bring us together in this crazy world of sitting around talking about music for two hours and you guys <laughs> do it every week. So we had always been friends and we'd kind of just been like, we kept saying, we need to start a blog. We need to start a blog. That sounds and a lot like we need to start a podcast. Yeah. We need to start a podcast. Mm-hmm. And but we, we had, but we had yeah. been mu- mutual friends uh, and like say hello at party, fr- party friends for a long time. And then um, our friend Angel was like, I don't know why... Like, I don't know why you guys aren't together all the time. You're because you're person. insane. You're and then insane. we started to find that out. And, you know, I remember just, like, sitting in your apartment for the first time and seeing, like, your X-Files DVDs. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Is this another X-Files nerd that I've And this? then to say the other movie that you saw on my DVD oh, things um, that you were, like, uh, done. Heart and Soul starring um, 13 on the cool scale Robert Downey Jr. Mm-hmm. Where he has, like, a bunch of... Um, guardian angels who like died in a bus crash the day he was Kira Cedric and Alfred Woodard and it's amazing she's the only other person I know who owns it so uh, so we finally started the blog and like well what really was the motivator I think was the getting into the asylum of the Daleks press round table and we just kept being like why don't we have anything to preserve this this that was that was amazing that we got into that and so we finally, and then just were tossing around names, and she came up with Head Over Feels, because I just kept being like, we need to have something about feelings. <laughs> and then she just goes, Head Over Feels, and then the web address was available, the Twitter handle was I know, available. We were shocked that that was all And available. so it was, like, meant to be, and so we just launched it, and we never thought that more than, like, our friends and, like, maybe our Twitter followers would read it and now we are you know almost 18 months old and we've yeah. had over 200,000 views on, we the, about 250 the, yeah. on the website right. and Sorry. you know we've kind of expanded at first we just started it was really just a lot about Doctor Who but then we've kind of like expanded into we you recap know, certain things weekly we do parks um, we we scandal. recap scandal with animated uh, gifts which came out of us we used to recap smash Right. With animated gifts, but it was mainly like rage gifts because the show made us so angry. But now Scandal is like the perfect show because all you all we do is we are like living reaction gifts when we watch Scandal because we're just flailing about everywhere. We recap Sleepy Hollow, and then we've uh, <laughs> one of the things that we really loved is and this kind of goes with the playlist curation is like. Kim was talking about her top twenty episodes of How I Met Your Mother, and we were, we were sort of do these, uh, try to curate our lists of the shows that we really love and maybe, like, either the most representative episodes or our favorite episodes, um, for anniversaries or kind of big happenings in the, in the history of those shows. So for the, um, for the 20th anniversary of the X-Files, we did this, like, into, it was the most exhausting. We, in a, in a weekend, week we curated, <laughs> in a weekend, we curated our top, 30 episodes, and we marathon pretty much yeah, we marathon like all 30, 30 of them to watch them and then pare it down and then rank them, which was one of the biggest tests of our friendship was <laughs> ranking the X-Files episodes, because we both had a different idea for number one, 
and it was us yelling at each other over Twitter about things before we finally settled on it. But then we were writing it with a deadline because we wanted to get it up before the 20th anniversary panel in San Diego. And, like, we had... It was really the most intense three day, you know, three or four days of our blogging life, and I'm literally trying to finish the last post writing about the number one episode arc, and there's 20 minutes before the panel starts in San Diego, and I'm like, this has got to get up before the panel, and I'm like, crying, and I'm just like, this is terrible, and so finally I was like, this is done, I'm done, and I hit publish, and then she like, read it on the train. I read it on the train, and I was crying, because it was so good. Um, anyway, so we curate these lists, what else do we do on the blog? I mean, we do We do bit character examinations, like, we did a whole series on friends, of, and we really, like broke down why we love all six of those characters and we're planning on doing that with uh, Sex in the City this coming summer. We uh, we were at uh we were at Comic Con this year as press, so we got to do some really cool stuff like the Sleepy Hollow press panel, which was really amazing and we got to interview the cast and creators of Sleepy Hollow. You got um, to have um what's his name? Tom Parker. Mason. No, no, the other one, nice. um, um, Hug Your Boobs. Who was oh, that? Oh, John, John Barrowman. John Barrowman. Captain Jack. Captain Jack, well, we Hug paid, Your Boobs. We paid for that. We paid for that. We paid for and that. And you gladly paid <laughs> for gladly it. We gladly did. I mean, because we went in there and we told him, John, we don't have any boundaries. And he was like, oh, in that case, boobies. And he <laughs> pushed us together and shoved his head through us. And <laughs> As John Barrowman one of the do. greatest pictures <laughs> It Ever. is still the it's... banner photo of the Facebook page. No, we changed it. We changed okay. it from Gallifrey because we went to Gallifrey One, which is the biggest uh, Doctor Who convention in North America, and it's held this year. This year's convention sold out in seventy-five minutes. They sold out it's faster than because San Diego I wanted Comic-Con. to go, and, and uh, that's not happening now. <laughs> it, we went this year, and we met Billy Piper, which was. Unbelievable, actually. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, she's delightful. So that's our timeline picture oh, gotcha. now. And our profile pictures with Paul McGann, who... Right, the Eighth Doctor. The Eighth Doctor, who we're completely in love with now. Um, that is awesome. But so yeah, that's what we do. We go to... Com- we cover conventions. We... We basically, you know, we love the things that we love. And we break and down the things that we love and say why we love them. And examine why other people love them. And, you know, she wrote a great post about talk about painful ships is she has a great post about Josh and Donna from the West Wing Mm. of that long drawn out thing that that's the kind of things that we we examine well uh, it it's definitely it's obviously headoverfeels.com if audience you have not figured that out yet they're on Facebook they are on Twitter they also have this great page on their website where they feature their friends' websites. Yay! Yay. And we feature you guys. And you do, Yay. and which is wonderful. And we also feature you on our link page on our website. And um, I want to announce officially on the podcast that I've been talking with Kim and Sage for a while, and we're going to do some crossover stuff. I would like to write some music and possibly video game-related articles for Head Over Fields. Um, they want to do some music-related stuff for Crash Chords, so we're going to curate that in the coming months and... Look for that on both websites. Um, I'm honored that you would like to have us write for you, and we're happy to have you write music stuff for us. Woo-hoo. So it should yes, be a lot of fun. Um, fun big collaboration fest. Before we wrap up completely, I, I imagine, that. Steve, you have a spam email for us. Of course I have a spam for you today. Or maybe I don't. Maybe I'm denying. Maybe I am going to deny Steve, you. don't drag this out. You're sick. Oh, you want to go home. Steve. Yeah. A really informationormative... Post and lots of actually honest and forthright comments produced. This undoubtedly got me thinking a whole lot about this concern. So cheers a whole lot for dropping. <laughs> By LQ1 Loser8. I know that guy. Oh, do you? Yeah, I do. He's, He's a, a real jerk, isn't he? Yeah. Really yeah. Really um, I miss Nike Could shoes. Could just be LSR, I don't know. Lizard. I miss the Air Jordans, guys. I, I miss the guy talking about his catheter... <laughs> we had a whole spam. It went on for like two paragraphs, and it was all about his catheter. We had one that was actually just question marks, and then it was question marks in the address, which is really confusing because I didn't think you could do that. Oh, I know it was like, it's magic. It's a ghost in the machine. Insert the catheter into the urethra. It went something to that. Oh effect. my! Yeah, it was very. Yeah. Right. There's rapid. something in the Wi-Fi. Awful. Yeah. Yes. Um, next week we have another guest. Um, we're very honored to actually have. I don't know how I became friends with Susan Pike, but I did, of the Barbaric Yops, um, 
I can't believe she wants to come on the podcast, but she is. She's bringing us the band Project 86 and their album Rival Factions, which I believe is an older album. Um, I believe she's going to perform some songs for us. So that's kicking off April right. We're having Susan Pike, and we're really honored to have her on. It should be great. Um, now, of course, before we wrap up, I want to thank you both for coming on the podcast. It's thank been a pleasure. You. And we will reconvene, reconvene in the future and do maybe another playlist or do maybe you guys can agree on an actual album you want to do. If that won't scar your friendship, because who knows? Oh, that could be we'll problematic. Um, but I do appreciate you guys coming up, coming on, and I'm looking forward to <clears throat> doing more collaborative work with you. I love the website. Um, I love the writing and the work that you do. You are skilled gift users and skilled <laughs> childish makers. It's our main joy in life. So thank you again for joining us. And if you'd like to read us out, as they say, nobody says that. Nobody does. Right. Music, Music is life and, and life is good. Is good.